My name is Mr. Beat, and I want to greet you. Hello, welcome to 10 Questions. This is a live stream slash podcast. I've been doing it for a couple of years now. It's so much fun. I have great conversations. Uh, so far, it's been all educational creators, edutubers, as some of us call ourselves. And this time, I have probably my favorite YouTuber. <laughs> It's kind of weird saying that, but no joke. I love his channel. His name is Jay Foreman, and it's how would I describe Jay's channel for for uh, folks who don't know? Uh, it's it's basically a geography channel, but there's a lot of emphasis on um, I would say the UK and London in particular because he's based out of London, uh, but. Also, he started out as a comedian and musician, and he still does that. Like one of my all-time videos of Jay's is where he has songs about all of the country's shapes, trying to figure out which one is shaped like a rectangle. And it's uh, it's a work of genius. Um, he's just really good at like, you know, you're learning stuff, but it's just so darn entertaining uh, that you don't even realize you're learning. Uh, hilarious, lots of, of jokes, a very British type of humor, very uh, uh, kind of surrealist again type of humor, but I think most of you probably don't even need me to introduce him because you already watch him. So anyway, without further ado, please everyone welcome Jay Foreman. Oh, a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. I Thank feel like you. I've written a long introduction about you as well. All right, your turn. Go. Right. Um, actually, no, before we do introductions, um, I need a sort of disclaimer. Um, I'm technically not supposed to be here because um, I've got oh, yeah. COVID and I tested positive for COVID both today and yesterday. I, I should be iller than I feel. So I'm just going to say early on, if at some point during the podcast, if maybe halfway through question five, I suddenly collapse off screen, that's why. But apart from that, lovely to be here. Hello. Yes, I'm so sorry you got COVID. Uh... It's uh, oh, completely your fault. I, I don't think, yeah, I was going to say, we haven't met in person before, so uh, I don't think I gave it to you or anything. And I'm, I am taking precautions. I've decided not to be in the same room as you. So uh, that's good. That will help. But yeah, like uh, I also, I entered in addition to my introductions here, because you believe it or not, there's a few folks that maybe don't know about your channel. Like when you have people ask about what you do for a living, what do you tell them? Well, that's actually one of the questions I've got prepared for you discusses that very thing. But I genuinely, um, describing what my channel is about, you'd think after doing it for more than 10 years, I would be better at it now, but I really struggle. The only thing that all my videos have in common is it's something I'd want to watch and I've gone and made it, but I don't really know how to summarize it nicely. I guess if I was doing this, if I was working for somebody else and I had to write some, you know, a nice buzzy paragraph for it, I'd have nailed it by now. But all I can say is, Pretty much exactly how you put it it's geography with an emphasis on london because that's where i live and it's got a few dregs left over from back when i used to do more stand-up comedy yeah yeah uh and it's difficult to get on stage in front of folks and uh you know kind of command attention of a crowd so i think it carried over quite well for all your videos because you just know how to keep the audience tuned in of course your videos are very digestible usually Less than 10 minutes, like my videos get way longer than that. And um, I often have to watch, go back and watch a second time because there's stuff that I miss because like it's just packed, like subtle things. That, like, that. I mean, my, my target audience has always been people who don't have the slightest interest in what I'm talking about. Because if you <laughs> are interested in the topic, you're going to watch anywhere. Like, you know, the, the nerds will come. Don't worry about them. The people I'm always way, way more concerned about are people who have never seen my channel before. They're not at all interested. They don't even understand the topic I'm talking about. And they are the people I want to hook. They're the people I want to get interested in sharing it and watching it again. And that's why I try and make sure no videos outstay their welcome. I keep them short and I make sure that there's, you know, it, it looks different every five seconds or so. So if I've been walking for a bit, cut to some graphics and then after some graphics, cut to me sitting, cut to our standing and so on, just to make sure that, you know, the same way you'd make a kid's show, you got to make sure that they can't get bored because it's easier than ever nowadays to just click another tab or look away and watch something else. But if you just keep things happening and give people a reason to pause and read it more carefully and watch again, then hopefully that's the right way to do it i think i discovered your your videos like 2014 ish 
that long ago. And oh, I wow. think I think Tom Scott, <clears throat> who uh, I've met, I actually met him uh, a few times, and I think you knew him or something, or he, he brought you up or something. Tom and I knew each other before there was a YouTube, so we were both together at wow. York University, and we knew each other. We knew each other's stuff, and then we sort of we started making videos at around the same time. Okay. And, um, what a well, wicked thing, you know. Tom Scott said goodbye after ten years. Oh uh, man, yeah, that was. He'll be back. Yeah. I well, yeah, he's still doing other things, but but yeah, the, I bring that up because like uh, I remember watching your, your video in 2014, and you were walking towards the camera. You were outside. People were around, you know, out and about, and uh, I was just like, I should do that more. And <laughs> I, I got to say, you have inspired me actually tom too as far as like getting out of my studio getting out of my basement really and just shooting out in the real world because that's so much fun it's a lot of work but yeah it's, it is a big fat you know it's a lot of effort yeah. but i think it really is worth it because we call it when we're planning an episode of either matt men or unfinished london um the term we use is fresh air and you need as much fresh air as possible in the video go outside go on the location and it's sort of First of all, it shows that a little bit of effort's been made and it's not just someone in one room. You know, it makes it a lot more fun to watch. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's more fun to do as well. I think, you know, it's the reason my stuff looks like it does is because it's trying to look like TV. And my first video, the first episode of Unfinished London from 2009 is inspired by a series on BBC4 um, from 2003, all about, I'm trying to remember what it's called now, um, Mark Steele Lectures which was this um, doc series of documentaries about important people from history, but it was, you know, it was made like comedy sketches and it was really, really funny, like laugh out loud funny, but none of it untrue. And I thought that was amazing. And that's what I was trying to emulate. And because it was trying to emulate TV, of course, it's got expensive cameras and going on location and walking around and cutting to graphics. And years and years later, YouTube now looks more like it, but you know, we were trying to make it look in that style with the walking towards camera, with the fast cuts and the tight scripting, because we weren't inspired by the rest of YouTube. We were inspired by BBC four. And ah. we try and stick to that now. I was one of the comments I get all the time. People say your videos, they look so 2014. And that always <laughs> baffles me because in my head, 2014 is like five minutes ago. So, you know, there's a bunch of whippersnappers out there that have spotted changes on YouTube that I haven't noticed because I'm still trying to look like TV in the 90s, I guess. It's just a, well, let, let's just say the quiet part out loud. I think a lot of YouTubers, they just don't get out much. They just like, yeah. it's so much easier just to kind of stay, you know, within your pajama pants. Um, it is tempting. Uh, I'm in my, I'm you, in my pajamas, by the way, under this. Oh, okay. Well, it's better than nothing. Um <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like I, you kind of already started to answer one of my questions. So I guess we should probably start get into it. Let's do uh, it. So for the audience, um, if you have questions, I try to get the super chats when I can, like, but generally, uh, we try to stick around a little bit at the end for questions. So if we don't get to your questions, I'm so sorry, but in general, I can't see them on the monitor, but, um, my wife just here is actually able to watch the comments come in on the stream. And, you know, if anything horrible comes in, she can let us know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was doing that. Well, what else would you be doing? <laughs> <laughs> my my wife does the same thing. Yeah, this is great to have. Also, kind of for like the troublemakers in the chat. Uh, <laughs> actually, I should make I should make her a mod. Can I do that? Ooh. What's your? Uh, well, while while I'm trying to figure that out, maybe. Uh, step she's not doing this. Me, if you, she's got my phone. Oh no, you don't. Oh, as long as you, I'll make you a mod. I will make you as a, a mod. Um, Stefan and Emperor Tiger Star have two questions you can answer first before we jump into it. Stefan, uh, fellow uh, edgy tuber, Jay, you're a legend. What's your favorite biscuit? Chocolate hobnob. Do you ah? You don't have chocolate hobnobs in Kansas, do you? No, and I don't think I tried it when I was over there. I'm gonna try and explain a chocolate hobnob. Uh, imagine um, a crunchy biscuit, a very very sweet biscuit, but it's also got a lot of oats in it. It's like a very oaty sort of porridgey honey like biscuit squished down with a big thick layer of chocolate on top and it's nicer than any other biscuit that's a chocolate hobnob okay then uh, i will i will check that out uh and then the other question while we're waiting on me to find your, uh you as a mod uh emperor tiger star what's your favorite musician uh slash bands i mean i have an answer but i'm worried it makes me really basic and dull does it make me really basic and boring you say the beatles I'm... aren't you yeah but the thing <laughs> is i mean i know this is controversial right but I think they're really good. <laughs> also, um, my wife can back me up on this. Like, um, I count as a proper Beatle nerd. 
um, a lot of my um, output when I do stuff on stage with musical comedy is about the Beatles, and I'm like a huge yeah. Beatle geek. And they've influenced my comedy stuff as well, because the Beatles were funny as well as um, being great musicians. Uh, yeah, very, yeah, definitely subtle humor, more subtle than your humor and your songs, I think. But uh, I can't find comment. Um, hey, Jay's wife, what's your name again? My, my wife's name is Jade, which is Jade. extremely it's extremely confusing because you know uh, I, I almost oh yeah JJ yeah, yeah that's right. Oh, right people get like, our, our kids get mixed up all the time uh, Jade could you please comment in the chat and then I will make you a mod that way because I can't seem to find I can't you can't you unable no. to because I haven't been subscribed for more than five minutes she's not been subscribed oh for five I minutes I apologize for that rule okay I'll, then we'll have to do it later I'm so sorry later okay. on well, let's get into the questions. I'll start us off. Um, oh, how'd you do that? You pressed a button and made the words first yeah. question. Oh, that's fancy. StreamYard is the uh, website I use to, yeah, it's pr pretty handy. Very um, nice. So, okay. Wow. Where do I begin? Um, one of my original questions was, uh, does Wales exist? But I, I crossed that one out. So, Does Wales exist? Right. Yeah. It depends which map you look at. <laughs> because on 99.99999% of maps, yes, Wales does exist, but there is a uh, notorious map produced by the EU back in 2004 that shows a big patch of sea where Wales should be. And what's interesting is it is very easy for maps to make mistakes, um, and that's a great topic for videos, by the way. But yep. what was interesting about this one, someone had to put extraordinary effort to draw sea where Wales was. Because it's not like they missed the border and made it look like part of England. They made it look wet. They made the coastline look like there was never a Wales. Um, oh, I'm sure there's funny. a link to it somewhere. But, um, that's so, how the meme um, got started then, probably. Yes. Yeah, so, so if you look at that map, the answer is no. And as for whether New Zealand exists, definitely not. Oh, yeah, because it's never on man. Many maps. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a class, the classic there. I always feel bad because for Wales, because when we visited, we, you know, we went to England and Scotland. They get all the attention and... Uh, poor Wales and Northern Ireland never get the attention. But anyway, uh, that's not one of my questions. That doesn't count. Uh, oh, shall I take back my answer then? <laughs> take it back. Uh, okay, yeah, no, like, uh, how did you decide you wanted to do exclusively educational videos? Because you started out, it was uh, musical comedy stuff. Like, I mean, that was mainly your stuff, right? Well, I wouldn't have used the word education when I started. Um, the reason that we made our series Unfinished London is because me and my friend Paul, who to this day, we still make Unfinished London, the two of us together. Um, we, in, in those days, we wanted a career in proper telly. He wanted to do uh, directing and camera work, and I wanted to do writing and possibly presenting. We just wanted to both be involved in that world. And so we made a showreel, and we made this documentary all about the unfinished northern line behind Edgware, because we know that story, because we live close to there. And we made it like a, you know, full of comedy sketches because we've been inspired by the Mark Steele documentaries and we just wanted to make it funny. I would not have called it education back in those days. It was a, a documentary, um, I suppose. What's happened in the years since then is that we now have words for these things. In 2009, you wouldn't have heard the word educational YouTuber. You wouldn't have even heard YouTuber. And you certainly wouldn't have heard video essay. You know, these are terms that didn't exist. Yeah. Um, but what I started with, and I'm now still doing and, you know, trying steadfastly to commit to doing it the same way as when we started, the word for it now is educational YouTube, which I suppose I've fallen into by default. But it's perfectly okay if you watch my videos and don't learn anything. <laughs> I will say also, though, you mentioned this earlier, like your your whole goal is to like get somebody who is totally uninterested in the topic. But uh, that's so true because I was watching one of your videos one time and my 12 year old uh, who does not watch my videos, she adamantly <laughs> hates my content. Like both my daughters are like, you know, dad, this is boring. Um, but you commanded her attention when she was just walking in the room. She just stopped and she like watched half the video. I don't even think she realized she was doing it, but like well, you were just my target like, audience, not being interested. You know, that's exactly who I'm trying to get to watch. <laughs> well, I was interested in this stuff anyway. Well, also though, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's a very narrow, um, you know, range of top. I mean, you're a lot of times you're just talking about London stuff, you know, and I know London's the center of the world and everything. So, 
Greenwich Mean Time, whatever. But well, the wonderful thing about YouTube is that the, if if you make something, even if it's disastrously really specific, you'll find an audience for it, and you can go yeah. down rabbit holes. Especially nowadays, you can go down rabbit holes of YouTube videos about really alarmingly specific things, and I think that's the way to get big on YouTube now is to find something that nobody else is doing rather than find something that anybody could do. So I, I get a lot of people asking, why do you only do videos about London? And the answer is, I live here, I know enough about it, and there's enough of an audience for it. And I think if I was making stuff um, about the whole world in general, it would be a harder job, I think, to make it different and interesting. Yeah, definitely. I'm the only one in the entire world who's uh, made a video about every recession and depression in American history. So yeah, I can totally relate to that. Okay, what's your first question? My first question, here we go. I'm going to bring it up. I've got it on my phone here, super professional. My first question is on my notes section, which is temporarily, here it is, <clears throat> question one. You and I are both, for enormous want of a better word, YouTubers by profession. Whenever I have to fill in the occupation box for filling in forms, I bulk a bit. YouTuber is, at best, not a proper job, and at worst, a slur. Do you feel the same way? What are your thoughts on being the word YouTuber? That's my question. Yeah. Wow, what a what context for that question. Um, yeah, I think it is, it's a tricky thing because it depends on who's asking you the question, what you do for a living. Um, yeah. My parents are just now, all these years later, realizing what I do because, uh, you know, they don't watch YouTube that much and they only started last year. So, uh, you know, if you're above a certain age, um, you generally just say, uh, I'm a video producer. Um, actually, some of like my grandparents still think I'm a teacher and they're when I one time I like, they yeah. are. My, my, yeah, I have two grandparents still alive. Um, they're both um, around 90 years old. And I try to explain it to them. And it was just like, you know, that spinny d wheel of death on Apple computers. It's like they, <laughs> they couldn't write, they couldn't comprehend. So I just like, I'm basically still a teacher, but just on the internet. And like, oh, okay. Yeah, I know what the internet is. So um, well, what do your grandparents do for a living? Because maybe you'll have just as hard a time understanding their job. Yeah, many different things. Oh, yes, my grandpa was a milkman. No. Uh, he was actually a postal worker for many years. Uh, my grandma worked uh, in retail for a little while, but mostly she had twelve kids, so she was home a lot. Most oh, that was her job. Yeah, she was a she was a mom. Um, but anyway, I uh, younger folks like the weird thing too is like I live right in uh, the middle of the United States in Kansas, and it's a small state. Uh, there's a relatively big city nearby, Kansas City, but. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one in my town of a hundred thousand people that does this. And so it is an isolating thing because that's also why I like to do this podcast because I gives me an excuse to talk to other people doing the same thing that we can relate. You know, it's like, you're my coworker colleague, you know? So it's, it's a weird thing. Um, do you, uh, yeah, what do you tell folks when they ask you what you do? Or I already asked you that earlier, but like... Yeah, I struggle. It depends. I mean, I actually had to fill in a form really recently because uh, my son's birth yeah. certificate. Um, and I think I went with comedian. And that might be because comedian garners ever so slightly more respect. You know, it's not a, a made-up word, really. And it's, uh, a bit, um, it's a bit less specific. And I think also because um, when my eldest was born, I was closer to comedian than YouTuber. So I just wanted to say the same on both of them. Oh, wow. But yeah, it is a difficult one. And I wonder if I'm actually being an old fashioned fuddy duddy and finding the word YouTube to be a slur when it could well be that in 100 years time, people go YouTuber. Yeah, that's a job. That's a proper job. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really I didn't answer that part of the question. But yeah, I think a lot of younger people will just think it's I mean, most young, most younger Americans do want to be a YouTuber when they grow up still. A lot then, of the interesting thing is like I have been asked before, what do I want to do in, in my dotage? You know, what is my career going to look like in 10, 20, 100 years? And this is something that is uncharted territory. We don't yet know what a veteran YouTuber looks like because YouTube is still very, very new. So exactly what is my career going to look like in 10 years time? And are the kids, you know, are they still going to want to be YouTubers? Or are they all going to want to be whatever's come along to replace TikTok? It's funny that you mentioned that because uh John Green just released a video about that very thing. Uh, you know who John Green is? I actually don't. Can I go um, off and Google and come back? Uh, he's an author, but he, him and his brother, Hank, um, they, well, they're the ones who started uh, VidCon. Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, 
he, he here's the video. It's called "Being Old on YouTube." That's exactly what he the video is about. He Ooh. just a few days ago. Um, yeah, you recognize those guys? Come on, yeah, yeah, they're kind of a big deal. Uh, I gotta check it out then. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's a weird thing. It's because uh, when I graduated college uh, the first time, I got three pieces of paper, um, lots of debt, but uh, which you don't have to worry about over there uh, as much. Um, but anyway, the first time I got a college degree was 2004, and YouTube did not exist in 2004. Have you frozen? Or is this a dramatic pause about the first time you got into college? Have yeah. I frozen? Uh-oh. Are you now, still... Did you freeze or did I freeze? I think, I, I think, I think I'm frozen right now. Let's see what that looks like. Whoa, can, whoa. You, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, but okay. what about the boys and girls watching at home? Let's see here. Last I heard, you said when I was in college, and then you, you, there was a dramatic pause. Oh, the good news is they, they can see us just fine. So uh, it's just you on your end, apparently. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, you did that that video about um, those big cables under the ocean, um, the uh, internet cables. So maybe those uh, are messing up right now. <laughs> oh yeah, they're being eaten by sharks as we speak. Do you want to log out and log back in? See if that helps. Um, is it frozen still? It seems to be working. Um, it's, it's, my wife says it's working. Okay. Okay. It's just frozen on your computer. Is it? It's oh, it's not. Okay. It seems fine to me. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 All right. Um, I thought it still was. Sorry. Oh uh, no. What I meant was earlier was you did freeze, but for a little bit, and now oh. everything's fine. Okay. This is what the people came to see. <laughs> Um, would you like I'm my frozen. second question or is it your second question? No, I'm kidding. I'm not really frozen. Sorry. Okay. My second question. Um, so, uh, what inspires you to write songs? Um, and do you, and do you miss it? Like, uh, cause you know, I, you do, really I, mean, I used to love doing live comedy and writing songs. It was a completely different career. I often find it strange that I do these two things because they've got very little to do with each other. And I think a lot of people that follow me for one half of my career, know nothing about or are surprised by the other half. Um, what I like about live performing is you get the instant feedback. You know, you can uh, do a joke and, you know, you get a laugh in the room. And that's a wonderful thing that you don't get on YouTube. Like you have to wait such a long time for a payoff on YouTube when you make a joke. It might take months between when you, you know, come up with it or say it on camera and then you hear it back. Um, but on the other hand, what I do love about YouTube as opposed to um, performing on stage is that you can do it again. And you can do take after take and you can edit it and you can hone it down and you can do jokes with precision timing that you can't really do on stage with a guitar in front of a few people. Definitely. They're two very different worlds. And the thing is, even though I very rarely do live comedy these days because I don't really have the time for it, I haven't given up officially. There are still a handful of gigs on the horizon and I do still do shows occasionally. And I am a little rusty, but I, I still love doing it. And I guess it's because you can't really do an official final last gig and hand in your notice and get a P45 from live comedy. You just sort of, you might look at your calendar and go, oh, I guess I haven't done a gig in a hundred years. That, that's how it happens. You don't know when it's going to finish. <laughs> yeah, you have a very dark sense of humor in your music, um, which I don't know if you know this, I'm also a musician and that's what I, I see. see that's it's right. behind you. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. I'll start singing one of your songs right now. Um, uh -oh. no, I don't know any of your songs. Um, I, but I, that's, you know, I, I didn't have the success that you did with my music probably cause it's not, it's mediocre, but I, it's a very similar track we took. Like I played lots of shows. My brother and I had a band. We, um, you know, it's sometimes you have audiences that are, uh, kind of, uh, vicious, uh, you know, I've had some very vicious ones. Cause uh, I don't know if you know, but a lot of the gigs that I did in the last five years or so have been for kids. I Ooh, that's so rough. what happened is I did a show at the Edinburgh Fringe uh, some years ago um, that was it was a show for adults but it happened to be in a venue that was normally used for kids shows it was in this like big inflatable igloo at in the Pleasance Courtyard and loads of parents came along to the show and said do you realize that all you have to do is take the swearing out of your songs and you might actually have a really good kids show and I thought about it and then I thought actually that's not a bad idea and I came back to the Edinburgh Fringe the next year the same venue, but at an earlier time slot with a show for kids called Jay Foreman's Disgusting Songs for Revolting Children that was very similar to the show the year before with just a couple of extra songs thrown in, the swearing taken out. And that show sold out. It's fun. And 
I took that show on a UK tour and I turned into a kids comedian, which on the one hand is very fun. And, you know, you get an audience that will stay with you for longer. But on the other hand, some of the worst gigs I've ever done have been with an audience full of children because there have been shows where it's not so much being the entertainment as being a babysitter. Uh... You know, it takes one kid to throw something and then that's the room gone. Um, I miss the grown up gigs more, I think. I did love doing the kids' gigs, but I think the gigs that I enjoyed the most were when it was a proper comedy night, when I was doing just, you know, 20 minutes of my best material and there'd be some other great comedians there. Yeah, there were loads of fun, those gigs. I'm sure it paid better with the kids' shows, though, right? Well, you sell more merchandise at kids' shows. Yeah. You flock I... CDs into parents. We made a children's album um, because it was a similar situation. It's like because I had a, I had songs about tomatoes and flossing, and they're like, "Why don't you just like make children's songs?" I'm like, "Okay." And did you have but, a song about tomatoes and flossing? <laughs> well, my daughters uh, helped me make it, so that was kind of the whole fun of it. Was uh, they were singing background vocals, and they actually helped write the songs. And so, uh, is this two uh, different songs? One about tomatoes, one about flossing, or a song separate. about tomatoes and flossing in one song? Oh, to, you say tomatoes. That's weird. Uh, yeah, no, they're two separate songs. Um, I have one song about how I don't like tomatoes. Um, it's called Here's What I Have to Say About Tomatoes. And the only lyrics basically are, I don't like tomatoes. I'd rather eat potatoes or maybe some Gardettos. That's all the, the lyrics. I'm not a big lyrics guy like you are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, I just think it's weird because... We, I didn't realize until much later on. I, I I've been watching your videos for a few years, and then I was like, oh wait, he's a musician, <laughs> he's a comedian. I didn't even know, like you were saying. And so I went back. I, mean, I was encouraged when I went to. So here in London, we have actually I don't even know if it's still there, but near King's Cross, there's like the YouTube Creator Space, and they occasionally have events on, and we go down. There's other YouTubers there, other creators, and you know they give you advice. And one of the things I was told a good few years ago was make sure your channel is one thing. Like you know if you've got um, some clips from your live shows where you're doing live comedy and you've also got your documentaries about infrastructure stick to one and not both because people will get confused and they won't come back i'm not sure entirely how true that is but i i followed their advice and i stopped uploading videos from my live shows so i think a lot of people if they subscribe to me in the last seven years or so um that they'll have no idea that i did the live stuff because it's buried right at the back and it doesn't get recommended because it's not the same people watching and it's not about the same thing but it's pretty successful. Like you have songs that have mu millions of views. I mean, it's a. Uh... It's actually so. What happened was um, many, many, many years ago, and I didn't have many subscribers at all back then. I think I had fewer than a thousand subscribers when this happened. I uploaded a clip from a live show of me doing my singing one syllable delay trick at a live show. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. and so that video did. I, I thought I was really happy with it. It got thirty thousand views. I was very, very happy with that. And then one day, someone sent me a message on Twitter as it was then known, uh, and they go, what happened to your syllables trick video? It's gone. And I checked, and yeah, it was missing. And um, so I checked with YouTube, and I said, why is this video not appearing? And they said, you deleted it. And I said, no, I didn't. And they said, yes, you did. And I said, no, I didn't. And they said, yes, you did. And then this went on for a few hours. And then eventually they said, well, look, we're sorry, it's gone. Um, what we recommend is upload it again and try your luck again. So I was furious. But then I found the video on an old hard drive somewhere, cleaned it up a bit, gave it a new thumbnail. And then the second time I uploaded it, the views grew much, much, much faster. And it was my first video to get a million views. And it kept wow. growing from there. And that was actually the catalyst that got my channel growing and got more people watching, ironically, the documentaries. Um, so when I went to, for the first time, when I went to the YouTube creator space, and I said to them, did you, did you do that as a favor for me? And they said, no, absolutely not. Like, we can't do that. That's not a thing. You, you just got lucky. You just, you know, the algorithm was was happy with you on that day and be grateful yeah no uh i've talked to some of those folks at youtube that the algorithm the search and discovery team yeah and i was trying to like get answers and they're like basically they don't even know like you know no, the, the pro program at all and then they just like okay we'll see what, what happens <laughs> it is scary how well the algorithm knows you you know like you'll watch one video you've decided like especially because if i'm making a new video about a new topic that I've not previously been interested in. You'll watch one and then it'll serve up thousands of others that are down a rabbit hole you didn't know you wanted to go down. It, it knows you better than you know yourself. It's scary. Yeah, except the problem with me as a history researcher, a lot of times I'm researching like really disturbing history. And so I get recommended like 
really disturbed. Oh, here's another video about the Ku Klux Klan. I'm like, no, I, I'm done with the Ku Klux Klan. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a bed we make for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, it's, I think it's your turn. It's my turn. Right, here comes question two. Question two is, ah, this is a Philip. Well, hang on, what was that, my wife? Oh, um, my wife says, do you still want her to do modding? Because I think she's yeah. now been subscribed for more than five minutes. Congratulate. You better stay subscribed. You just now subscribed to me, by the way. I That's have been so hyped for a Q&A session with Mr. Beat than ever before. Go, Jay Foreman. Feel better soon. I like to eat apple. Thank you, Alexander Hamilton. Wow, the Alexander Hamilton. Okay, Jade, I have just... Uh... I realize I'm not logged into my, I'm on my personal um, well, account. So once, let me, once, once my wife becomes a mod, what can she then do? What should you do? You're just going to like. Can, uh, she has the power to execute people on the street. Oh, uh, oh wow. Uh, no, she can uh, like basically uh, if somebody's being uh, mean, uh, just make it so they can't comment anymore. So, That's fun. Oh, I thought I'd be able to highlight questions. Uh, so actually, my wife said, at this because I, um, me and Mark Cooper Jones off of Matt Men, uh, we've done broadcast before using an app that I'm not entirely sure whether it still exists called Stereo, yeah. where um, Jade was acting, uh, my wife was acting as the moderator by listening to audio comments coming in and filtering out all the bad ones, which was, you know, that's a far more stressful job than actually doing the podcast, was it not? Really, really difficult. She says it was really, she's you know currently um, feeding a tiny baby, and she just now winced and said, "Oh, moderating that was really difficult." Oh no, don't worry about it. We got other people there. I just you know. All right. Well, um, are you ready for uh, my question two? Absolutely. Uh, my question two is a, is a philosophical one, and it's this: <clears throat> I've invented a teleport machine. Here's how it works. It scans you and produces an absolutely perfect replica of you on the other side of the room or planet. This replica is accurate to the last molecule and is totally indistinguishable from the original, even to the user. It has exactly the same thoughts and feelings and memories. At the same time, the original version of you is instantly and painlessly destroyed. My question is, are you willing to step in my machine? <laughs> Only if um, it was like, absolutely necessary that i had to like get to where i needed to go <laughs> like you're really experiencing death yeah so yeah like, like you had a big commute that's fair. yeah that's like fair. if i need to be in uh, new zealand for example even though it doesn't exist i yeah <laughs> totally uh, i would like right away you know because uh i needed an organ transplant or something but otherwise I, yeah i've actually thought about this question before and I, I think a lot of people have because i've i have i came up with this question ages ago and i can't remember where i asked it before but i found out since then that this is the plot of a film called the prestige like you know it has been done before but i always find this oh, yeah. discussion really interesting and you find out a lot about how people think from how they answer this question oh wow yeah well i guess that's i mean i lean towards no though um unless there was it's always like it's the same thing like, uh, would you go to the moon um, or go to Mars? And I'm just like, I just really love where I'm at right now. I'm happy with my life. And, <laughs> you know, like it took a lot for me to go to the UK, actually. That was my first time in Europe. And I was just like, I guess the difference is going to the UK means being on a flight for about eight hours and going to Mars means, um, well, let's see, how long does it take nowadays um, to get to Mars? Depends oh, on how um, the, six, to, uh, not, six to nine months, I think, is what I read one time. I just oh, that's all right. Nine months. Yeah, I feel like I've not seen anybody in nine months anyway since I've had that kid. But you know, it <laughs> again, it depends if there's anything worth seeing on Mars. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I don't think, and you're just gonna, it's just gonna be just a horrible experience all around. Have you seen that movie, The Martian? No, Matt, Matt Damon. I, no, but I have seen Marvin the Martian from the Warner Brothers cartoons. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything I know about Mars is from those. I assume it's fully accurate. Yeah, it's totally. Um, anyway, I, that's probably not a philosophical answer that, that most people wanted. But, uh, I, yeah, I just. It's an honest answer. No, unless I'm in a hurry. I'm getting a scam call right now. Should I answer it? Yeah, do it. Okay. Hello? Hello? Hi. Oh, it's 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 a robot. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Oh, I what a load. Load. phoning us now. Yeah. All right. So, uh, sorry about that. We're on to the third question. That was a good, good segue for third question, which is about scams. Uh, um, let's see. Oh man, there is no good train. I'm always trying to make it so there's a good segue. Let's see. Uh, well, hang on. Ask me the question first, and then we'll work out a great segue. What was the last thing we just said before? Uh, there was scam call. Robo, robo call, scam call. Robot call. Okay, so we've got to come out of robot calls into whatever you've got next. Here we go. Um, how do you feel about the leeches who steal your creative works? Um, and the reason why I said this, I, I've seen your stuff like on TikTok. And I'm like, I'm pretty yeah. sure Jay doesn't know his stuff there. So uh, yeah, we've we've been talking about this the last couple of days. Uh, I'm not happy about it being there because arguably you could be scrolling through TikTok and find enough stuff that's taken from my YouTube videos to watch basically entire videos and then decide not to watch it again later. So arguably, these people pretending to be me are you know stealing from me. Um, there's a few ways I could go about it. I can either like contact TikTok and go through the proper process where you know you ask them to remove it for copyright reasons but i'm told that takes a long time so it might be more fun if i just start my own, finally get around to starting my own official tiktok channel and then ripping them off because that's surely fair game isn't it like imagine what their response would be hey i put effort into that and you oh oh yeah <laughs> clever i like the other fun thing i could do is sort of like you know get a pile on and ask everyone on who already follows me on youtube and twitter uh to say hey can you please spam this account that's not me and give them a hard time um don't do that though because i haven't decided yet whether that's the right <laughs> thing to do but that would be more fun oh the, the long-term answer is yeah i really do need to get on with getting on tiktok i think every video series from now on ideally should have some of it on youtube some of it on tiktok some of it in podcast form, basically just spread myself around all the platforms so that this sort of thing can't happen again. It's my own fault for not signing up to TikTok years ago when all the kids were doing it. Yeah, so you don't have an official TikTok, do you? I think I signed up. I think I logged in once and I have an account. My, oh, apparently. <laughs> apparently <laughs> you do. I do. My name is jforman4. That one is the real me. jforman.fans, the one that has many thousands of followers, is not the real me. So please give them a hard time on my behalf. Oh, there's apparently there are more, but um, that's the main offender, apparently. And okay. they're doing a worryingly professional job of taking my videos and making them square and putting subtitles in. Some of them, by the way, have been spelt wrong, which makes me furious because I would hope that people that watch my videos would know that I would never let that happen. Um, but yeah, short answer, uh, I got to get that sorted. Yeah, it's frustrating because I, I mean, I just feel like your channel, you have like what, 1.5 million subscribers or something. I, it should have 10 million subscribers easily. And I feel like part of the reason is like, you know, and because you put so much effort into these videos, like there's the attention to detail is remarkable. Like, I don't think people understand. And there's just something about like, I mean, just, it to me, it's um, it's really disturbing that so many people, particularly on on TikTok, are doing this. Um, I don't know. I I, I do. I think a lot of us should speak out about it more than we do. Yeah. So. I mean, I'm not the only one. It's happening to. There's loads of people on YouTube that have the same thing. And sometimes people rip my stuff off and put it back on YouTube. You know, where it's a lot easier for me to find. And it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because sometimes it's just wholesale re-uploading. And that is a no-brainer. Click the button. You're not allowed to do that. But sometimes it's so-called reaction videos. And yeah. I have mixed feelings about those because <laughs> most of them, I don't understand why it's entertainment. It's just someone, they put my video in the corner of the screen and kind of react to it. There's a few rare exceptions. I'm actually going to name this guy because he's the only one whose reaction videos I actually enjoy. He's a guy called JJLA. I don't know his real name, but he reacts to my videos by meticulously pausing and reading all of the stuff that you'd blink and miss. So I watched that and I realized that is what a reaction video could be. It's like the 21st yeah. century equivalent of a laughter track. You feel like you're watching somebody with an audience. You're, it's, it's why unboxing is popular. It's like seeing it through the point of view of somebody else. I get that. But he is the exception that proves the rule. The vast, vast majority of reaction videos, it feels like stealing. And it, it feels, I, I don't understand why it's entertaining unless you actually are willing to add something to it. And this is where it gets super complicated because 
if I decide reaction videos aren't cool and I press the takedown button on them all, then that means that there might be some that actually it's fair game and they are adding something to it and I don't want to take it down. And maybe right. these people are growing my audience. It's it's really hard to say because on the one hand, people might see reactions to my stuff and go, I'd like to subscribe and see it first. Or maybe the worst case scenario is they see the reaction video and go, well, I've seen it now. I don't need to watch the original and it's it's taken from me. It's really thorny. What are, what are your thoughts on it, by the way? I don't think... I don't think we actually benefit too much. Like in terms of like a lot of people that watch a reaction video are not going to go over and subscribe to our channel and support us. Um, but at the same time though, that I think that's somewhat true. And there are definitely good reaction channels out there. I actually uh, had one on this, uh, this uh, live stream podcast, uh, blogging through history. He does a really oh, good job. To be fair, yeah, he's done a couple of mine as well. I like his reactions because again, he will pause and add context. And yes. he'll preempt stuff that comes. And you know, like his reactions are for the same reason. They're satisfying to watch because he is adding something. He's adding his own take on it. But you yeah, know, again, another exception that proves the rule where the majority there was one video. It was a guy who he put my video in the corner of the screen and literally did nothing. He just sat smiling throughout the whole thing. Is is kind of terrifying. Yeah, that is terrifying. It's creepy, actually. Uh um, sure attention to it, really. I think what helps us though uh, is that we're on camera, and so we're like we're kind of part of the what the brand is, and so like I feel really bad for the voiceover channels who the animators who put all that effort into the animations, you know, and then they somebody else just re-uploads it, and uh, they might like put Russian subtitles on it or whatever. But uh, there's a lot of channels that do that for the, and so I'm less like, hey, get in front of the camera. You know, I know you don't like to, to be on camera, but at least they know it's actually you making it versus just, I don't know. Anyway, that's true. Actually, one thing I hadn't thought of. It's a good thing that no one is able to make a video and pass it off as mine without my face in it. Right. Because I'm, you know, my face is always in the video. So that I hadn't thought of that, actually. If I was just a voiceover, it would be a lot easier to actually pretend it was me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's... It's good and bad because it you don't really have as much privacy. I'm sure you get rec recognized out and about. Um, you know, we should say that actually we like YouTube, and it sounds like we're doing it down and saying, "Oh, it's just terrible doing what you love for a living," and you know, honing your own creations and unleashing onto the internet. Oh, it's just awful. No, it's not. It's brilliant, and I wouldn't change this job for all the cups of tea in the cupboard. True. Yes. Let's end on a positive note there. It, I, yeah. I love this job definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, I I think it's your turn. Yeah. It, right. My third question. It's exciting for me too because I wrote these questions a long time ago and I can't remember what they are. Oh, nice. Would you rather never hear any new music again or only hear new music from now on? So the scenario is the wizards come down and he's going to zap your brain and you either from this moment on have to forget all music you've ever heard before, but you're allowed to listen to as many new pieces of music for the rest of your life until you die as you like, or the opposite. Any new music you won't hear, it'll be silent to you, but you can still re-listen to all your old favorite songs as much as you want. Do you want option A or option B? Such a good question. These are these big philosophical questions. I lean towards the old songs because nothing is as powerful. Well, few things are as powerful as nostalgia mm -hmm. and when it comes to listening to new music, the reason why, especially older people, like people our age and older, they don't generally go out and discover new music. Um, if they do, it's often stuff that's been spoon fed to them endlessly. It's because, yeah, you, you already have like this backlog of stuff in your head. That's like, that's enough. You don't need to like, I have, I own 35,000 songs in my, on my hard drive, like my personal collection of, of MP3s. Oh, wow. I have a all that yeah i'm a big music fan but there's just only so much music you can listen to and also like um a lot of new music is let's just say it say just be honest it's reductive it's not necessarily like it's just like i mean some of my favorite bands actually i love them a lot actually my favorite band of all time is radiohead when we oh. were in, when we were in oxford i drag i drug my entire family to um the, the place where they played their first gig. Um, but anyway, like, you know, even Radiohead wasn't, I mean, you could say that they borrowed a lot from previous bands and a lot of bands that um, I love actually kind of 
ripped ripped off the Beatles, but in my opinion, they made better songs in, in many dif- different ways. Like power pop is my favorite genre, and so like you know, there's only uh, there's only so much you can do to experiment with music, and I feel like yeah, if you have everything in the there's been so much music released already. It doesn't even feel like we can create any new genres anymore. Does it seem like we can? Or I think we're done. Like there's experimental noise. Is like the, well, I, no, I don't think that's true. I mean, I I definitely agree with you that I would much rather hear the songs I'm already familiar with because um, I'm over fourteen. You know, if you're yeah. younger and you're you know you, you love nothing more than discovering new music and you want to be able to hear new things as you get older, then fair enough. But I think at a very young age, people tick over to option B, which is that, like you said, no, we we've heard enough. 35,000 on a hard drive is about enough to be going on with. And it's these days way more often that I hear a song on the radio and I go, oh, I love this song. Way more often that that happens than I hear a brand new song. I go, ooh, I like this new thing. That does still happen and I would miss it, but I'd miss my beloved Beatles and Radiohead even more. A lot of the reasons why we like music is because we've heard these songs several times. Most songs, when we hear them the first time, we don't automatically fall in love with them. It's not love at first listen, you know. Yeah, so that's another great questions, man. You're, oh, I was downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, all right. So, I did say I had a question about your significant other, but also like that's something yeah, I know. Don't take the camera towards my significant other. Are, are they still there, Jay? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, hang on. So the elbow. Oh, okay. Jay, well, no, like uh, one's out, but you won't see it. One of them's out, but you won't see it. <laughs> Oh, I don't, yeah, I want to get the privacy of, oh. Um, so, that's my wife and my baby. This is actually really exciting. I didn't know I was going to get to meet all of you. So nice oh, to you know what? Because of the angle of the camera, it looks like she's really small. But she, <laughs> she's just really far away. Whenever we take photos, Jay always like gets behind me, and I look gigantic. It's horrible. It's really annoying. So would you rather, hang on, if I go like this, you're like a yeah, pet, on my, that, like a pet on my shoulder. <laughs> However you want to do it. I think people under, understand. Although I have a really big nose. Um, so anyway, uh, so my question is, my my wife, my significant other, uh, I, she helps film my videos. Um, she does mostly the business side of things, but we're a, a team, a partnership. And I just want to like uh, get more, because it says like you're DOP in all the descriptions. Like you're the... Yeah. I want to see like what your role is and like I kind of want a, a, a peek behind the scenes as far as um, how you uh, help out. In the older videos, you're DOP. In the I new ones, you're director. It wasn't D- well, you've been DOP and you've been director. You've also, because the thing I'm is... I'm not DOP. I'm finished on the That's cool. It depends. Well, it depends on the video because I mean, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. I've actually been doing videos since before I met my now wife. So she's not in all of them. But... Um, You've done directing, you've done DOPing, you've done prop making, which you're very good at. Because Jade, I don't know if you know, but she works in proper television and before that worked as a stage manager in proper theatre in the West End. So she's got all these skills from the real world outside the internet that she can bring to videos. And it's often you telling me that a prop looks terrible and I can do much better than that or a lighting looks terrible. Sometimes you even change my hair. But yeah. <laughs> Mark, Mark gets really annoyed with me when we're filming because I spend quite a bit of time getting annoyed with Jay's hair. And Mark's like, you never pay my hair that much attention. <laughs> but I do. It's just that Mark's hair always looks quite good. Yeah. <laughs> also, Jade is a great sounding board. If I'm writing a script and it's about a very, very geeky topic and it's a bit too nerdy and specific, Jade can sort of put the brakes on and say, no one's going to know what that means. That's not funny. Or, you know. Jay, you're-, you're being very nice, actually. <laughs> I, I I was a naughty child and I didn't really go to school. So um, Jay will use me as a sounding board to know if and I if I don't know about something, he then works out that he needs to explain it better for the people who didn't go to school. <laughs> I mean, you know that. Hey, it's not. It just means you're not a dork. That's what it means. Yeah. Like, like that's a, that's the thing. Like uh, Shannon will say, Mrs. Beach. She'll say. Um, you know, like I feel so dumb when you're like with your history YouTuber friends. And I'm just like, no, that means you're normal. Like that means you're actually like, we're seriously like so much of what we know, so much of what I, I should just speak for myself. So much of what I know is just completely unhelpful 
in any situation <laughs> other, other than Jeopardy, maybe a couple Jeopardy categories. I think your your knowledge of American presidents has got to be very useful for trivia and quizzes and, you know, like no, knowing offhand when they died and what their last words were and what their favorite food was. Like, that has to come in handy, surely. Oh, yeah. It's, it makes me a very popular at parties. Um, yeah. <laughs> What was the que is, uh, what was the question? The question was, what's it like behind the scenes? What do you do? Oh. Yeah. yeah, like, uh, what do you have to put up with? Oh, <laughs> making giant mounds of spaghetti and uh, <laughs> the thing that I have to put up with, and Mark will agree with me, uh -oh. is Jay doesn't take direction very well. Oh, that's true. Because I don't. The, I'm awful. The information goes into Jay's ears and in his brain in a very different way to it would to most people. So when you're trying to say to Jay, <laughs> there's, a there's a sentence Mark and I say a lot, um, do another take, but different, because <laughs> Jay will do like, if you let him, Jay will do 50 takes of the same sentence I, and they will all be exactly the same. I'll tell you something freaky. <laughs> there's, there's a sort of hidden extra that is available on my Patreon of um, me filming um, one of the Unfinished London videos. And um, it's me it's a split screen of me in two different locations saying the same line because when we were filming, we didn't know which one we'd use. So I said it twice. Yeah. It's about 40 minutes apart on the day, yeah. but they are perfectly in sync. It's terrifying mm -hmm. that I did ex yeah. you know, it's as if it's a bit of music. It's I did the, the delivery the exactly movement. the head movements, the same. I'll send you a link. Because, uh, after this, this is another thing that I have to bring in. Jay loves to talk with head movements. So he delivers his lines like this and da -da 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 -da, and sometimes he'll get it's become part go, of my style. Stop moving your head. Yeah. <laughs> it drives me crazy. But uh, yeah, that that little video is really funny because that I think that's the first time he realized what I was talking about. Oh yeah. I'm stubborn too when it comes to like uh, my wife will say, um, you sure you want that in the video? I'm like, yeah, I'll be fine. And then I'll leave it in. And then I was like, you're later. You're right. I should have left that out. I should have. And she's also like, I'm getting ready to release. I have controversial videos. And so like, I'm getting ready to release a video about systemic racism. And oh, that's, that's yeah. And she's just like, you shouldn't do this. I'm like, it's going to it's going to get a lot of views, but you should do this. It's going to pay the bills. You shouldn't do this. Uh, we because you know conversations as well. <laughs> All right, well, a lot of jokes and stuff that Jay will either like want to keep in, and I'm like, <laughs> no, that's just it's not funny. No one's gonna get it, and like eventually I'll convince him to get rid of it. And yeah, I think we we argue about that kind of stuff as well. Obviously, well, Jay, these, these Jay are good gets, arguments though. Jay gets final decision because it's it's Jay's video. So there are a lot of conversations where I'm just like. You need to explain that or cut it or no keep that joke i love that joke that's really funny and then like jay will go mark jay finds it funny and just, yeah it stays in because mark's like fine if she thinks it's funny <laughs> david bennett's here i was going to recommend you talked about how much you loved radiohead i was going to say you have to check out this youtube channel called david bennett piano because he analyzes oh, radiohead yeah. and lots oh. of other songs um, check out David Bennett Piano because he talks about Radiohead a lot on his channel and it's genuinely wow. very, very good. And also, hello, David. Hey, David. Yeah, I'm going to subscribe. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, you. It's, if you ever want to um, some therapy uh, like for free. Yeah, you can you can chat with my wife and like. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I uh, frame you out now? Do you want to uh, say goodbye? Well, thank you so much for letting us. <laughs> yeah, that was, she's uh, still that was... here. Yeah, yeah. What? We uh, so we still can't talk bad about her, right? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so your turn then. Yeah, my turn. Question four. Question four. Here we go. So I was on my phone before trying to find that clip of the two me's giving the talk in exactly the same way with the two heads. Uh, I can't find it. So instead, I'll ask you a question. Ah, here we go. You know rather a lot about U.S. presidents. So my question is. Which two presidents would make the best sitcom about a pair of odd couple ghost presidents haunting the White House together? And as a bonus question, which actors should play them? Holy crap, what a great question. Oh, man. So you know about their favorite foods, you know about their habits, um, you know more about the US presidents, I think, than maybe anybody else. So you would know which would make the best odd couple sitcom. Where, where do you think, and of course, this is a fictional thing where you could get, you know, from many hundreds of years apart, occupying the same White House, where is the biggest personality clash between two presidents? Um, I think, 
you know, I don't want to get two presidents that are, um, yeah, I want the clash. I, I don't want yeah. them to be too similar. Um, it's a dull I, signal if they get on. Yeah, I kind of want to do, the first thing that pops in my head, I guess I'm going to stick with it, is um, Andrew Jackson and Calvin Coolidge. And I don't know if you know much about both those presidents, but Andrew Jackson was one of the most controversial presidents we ever had. Um, but at the same time, you know, like if it weren't for him, you know, democracy was became much a, a much bigger deal in the United States because of his presidency. Like, you know, uh, not just the aristocratic elites could vote anymore. It was just like the common man. Um, and so it wasn't all bad, but also he was like he was a dude who he got in duels. Um, he probably murdered over a dozen people I, by my estimation wow. in, in his life. Uh, he walked around with not one, but two bullets stuck in his chest for most of his life. Um, he was, so he was a really tough guy. Um, and very like fiery, like when he was in Congress, he, uh, uh, got, apparently he was so upset one time that he threw furniture um, this is just according wow. to one account. So maybe it didn't happen, but, um, this is why folks like Thomas Jefferson were terrified of him when he first was in Congress. Like, I hope this guy's never president, you know, and then he ended up being, and then you have Calvin Coolidge, who's the opposite because he was like, he, I don't think really ever wanted to be president, which is why I like him. Honestly. Um, he tried to do whatever he could to reduce the power of the presidency. He rarely, <laughs> he rarely talked. Like uh, he was like the quiet, like a really shy guy, um, really subtle, like smart and funny, but you wouldn't know it, like kind of just like sitting in the corner quietly, like staring at you, kind of like making you uneasy. So I just think it'd be funny to see those two together um, working to haunt the White House and actors. Um, I think playing uh, Andrew Jackson, maybe Ryan Reynolds, maybe is the first one that pops in my head. I don't know why. Yeah, you can have anybody from history. You know, you can go back to actors that oh. are British before. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Or you could pick a really skillful actor to play both presidents and watch them battle it out with technology. Oh, uh, I, I think... I mean, uh, also, in this version of the sitcom, if Calvin Coolidge is going to spend most of his time sitting quietly in a corner, that's quite easy to film. I think the uh, the best performance of a, um, of a, of a president, um, the movie Amistad, um, Anthony Hopkins played John Quincy Adams. He did that so well. Anthony Hopkins, uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins, uh, such a good actor. I think he could pull off any president probably. So we'll have Anthony Hopkins play both Calvin, Calvin Coolidge and Andrew. No, I don't know. Calvin Coolidge, I don't know who would play him. Maybe somebody in the chat can say, because I, I can't think of anybody. Who should play Calvin Coolidge in a movie? Chat, let us know. Can you bring up a photo of Calvin Coolidge? Because I yeah. actually, uh, my American president's knowledge is not as good as yours, and I don't know what he looks like. So if we can have a look. Okay. Uh, pick an actor. Uh, let's see. Oops. I mean, I'm quite lazy. I could have Googled him myself, but... Um, no, that's okay. We, we got to get... Like a, you, a, rather than having to Google what they look like, you've surely got a folder with all of them in. Yeah, this is... That's what he Oh, uh, like. David Hyde Pierce. Absolutely. Okay, now I got to Google who that is. <laughs> David Frazier. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're a fan of Frazier, are you? The old ones, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's that new one, yeah. Uh, well, he's not my Frazier. Oh, yeah, that's Calvin Coolidge right there. He is Calvin Coolidge. And yeah, he, he, uh, he could be very subtle. Well, um, now we've got to have a look at Andrew Jackson. All right. Well, Andrew Jackson is the first, uh, well, no, actually the second president ever photographed. So, but he's a really old, terrifying, like this is what he looked like when he was older. It was very terrifying. Um, oh, but wow. as far as when he was uh, more in his prime, uh, that's probably, so that dude on Night Court, um, maybe, what's his name? Uh, uh, that's the Night, Night Court. Uh, Let's see. He, th they did a reboot of the show Night Court, which was on when I was a kid. Uh, uh, what's his name? My yeah. first thought when I look at this guy is he could be played by uh, Anton Dubeck, the judge on Strictly Come Dancing. Who's that? Oh, he's not an actor. 
Unless you count those bits before the show gets started as acting. Well, I, was, I was thinking uh, this guy, John La Larroquette. John Larroquette could be Andrew Jackson. He's in, uh, of course, his personality is probably nothing like him. I don't know. Anyway, what a question. I'm, I can't wait to see what the chat, what is the chat saying? Peter, who's that? That's a book. Just have Jim Carrey play all of them. Yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, I think uh, we're doing, I'm already, I just realized we've already been going for an hour. So well, well, sure. we've got to pick up the pace, <laughs> get to the point. <laughs> don't want to take too much of your time. I know it's later there. Um, yes, what's your right. Life? What's your bedtime normally? Oh, you don't sleep because you have. Well, no, we try and go upstairs to bed uh, whenever this little boy lets us. Um, <laughs> it's not to do with that. It's normally, we're in bed by now, but yeah, that's the other. Bath after putting his brother to bed. Yeah, do you know the thing? Bringing up two babies at once is um, like you know we're doing an okay job of keeping our sons alive. They're all right, but <laughs> nothing else is getting done, including washing up or YouTube videos. So um, I'll have to wait and see what comes next on my channel. Or my son's development. One will have to come first. Which will it be? <laughs> oh, why not combine them? It's all good. I have um, put my son in my video before. There was a, I did a sponsor video ages ago where it's just me holding a baby and just staring down the lens and apologizing for not doing a good advert. And that was my real son in the video. I think I remember that one. Your adverts, as you call them, are amazing also. Like, oh, thank you. You're the only channel where I, I always watch every ad from beginning to end because it's like a skit. It's always like a little skit, especially the ones you do with Mark. Um, well, I feel, I, the, the way I think, think about it is like the adverts, everybody knows. Everybody watching knows that we're saying these words under duress. And there is, in my opinion, there's no point trying to segue from the content people came for to the advert. I think it's much fairer and much more fun for the screen to go black and then the advert starts and the two are entirely unrelated. And then of course, the only way I can satisfy the client and make sure that people do watch the ads is by making them good, by making them funny and by making them the sort of thing that you're just as likely to share and enjoy as the rest of the video. And, you know, it's getting harder and harder once we've, you know, used up a lot of our ideas and especially when, you know, you've done the same brand 12 times. Um, but they, they are a fun challenge and they're often a lot more, loose than the rest of the video because the videos themselves they can take years to write prepare and edit and film and then the adverts we normally just give ourselves a few weeks so it's more rushed and i think it shows and um but that's what makes it that's what makes it so much fun oh man yeah well i do agree with you it really takes because you know we i think us youtubers should view our videos as art I mean, what you do is art and uh, it does take away from the art form when you just have a really icky segue into like trying to icky trick, is the word. Yeah. Yeah. Tricking people to stick around. So you're like, oh, and yeah, I always have a separation as well. I like people know, OK, OK, now this is the sponsor part and uh, has nothing to do with the other part of the video. So don't even. <laughs> OK, uh, well, I brought up Mark, so I should probably bring up that question about him. Um, how did you begin working with Mark Cooper Jones? Well, so Mark Cooper Jones and I met at the Edinburgh Festival and on the London comedy circuit doing comedy together because he huh. and I, when we met, were both doing stand up. He was in a sketch group that I really liked called Wit Tank, uh, which is a three piece sketch group. Really, really, really funny stuff. And he also had his own solo stand up show, which was his shtick was he was a geography teacher because before he had his career doing comedy, he was a genuine geography teacher. So his wow. shtick, he'd dress up like an old teacher with the um, elbow pads with an overhead projector. And the premise would be that the audience is his geography class. And um, <laughs> I thought that show was great. And I really, really liked his stuff. He was aware of my stuff. And then he and I realized at one point that maybe we should team up and do something because we had this shared love of geography and maps and we had this background in comedy so we had a meeting and we discussed well what should it be should we do a, a joint show at the edinburgh fringe a one-off live show or what about a youtube video okay we could do something on youtube and that became map men and then the name map men was entirely mark's idea and the um the catchphrase we're the men and here's the map that was him as well um and we never imagined it would last as long as it has or be as popular as it is so um it started as we should do something together because we both have the same interests. 
and it's now become it's it's almost full time for me. Like about half my channel is Mapmen now. Yeah, you don't even do the politics unboring anymore. I the, the I, I got a bit exhausted with that because so politics unboring dates back from a time before Brexit when uh politics was a bit dull and you know it needed to be unboring for a young audience of first time voters. And I now think that these days it doesn't have to be un I've said this before, it doesn't have to be unboring. It has to be unbatshitted. And I don't have the stomach for it anymore because politics has become very divisive and depressing and you know whereas before i used to sort of enjoy attacking it like it was a tv show where you had to be uh, neutral and impartial and just trying to be positive about democracy um i find it harder than ever to be neutral and impartial about what's happened to politics now and i'd even go as far as to say it's irresponsible to be impartial when the people in charge are as awful as they are so you can hear me getting angry about it already that's why i can't make politics unboring anymore because it wouldn't be the same show like the angry bite to it would be furious you i never viewed you as impartial for the record because <laughs> always at the end of the video you'd kind of like okay here's what i think and but yeah uh i i mean that's all i do is most well not all i do geography a little bit of economics but it's primarily uh political history and the great thing about me that well it's not great but it's it, what helps me become less biased is that my cynicism toward all of it like i don't favor one political party i don't favor um i don't have this pet issue that i'm trying to promote i'm just like oh the whole system just brings me down so i guess i can't really you know um but i can't think, think that helps you t helps you as well when you made that series um maybe i'm wrong I was, the angle I wanted to have was I wanted to try and make the political system that we have here in the UK, which is quite nuts. And I wanted the facts to speak for themselves. And I wanted to arrange the facts in such a way that people who didn't know much about it would watch it and go, wait, that can't be true. That that has to be bollocks. No, surely not. But then they'd Google it and, oh, there are no lies in this. This really mm. is how it works. And I think that is a really good way of going about storytelling, whether it's politics or whatever you're making your video about, you know, try and make the facts sing for themselves and try to arrange your story in, a, in an order that what comes across is this is insane. And yet, if you were to Google it, you wouldn't find any lies in there. Like you've carefully arranged it so that it seems nuts. And that, that's great fun to do. Well, that's because so much of what governments do these days is just because of the momentum of history. They're just, mm -hmm. oh, well, we've been doing it for a long time, so let's just keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, they don't stop yeah, or yeah. anything we do in this country, for example. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, back to Mark. I mean, Mark is great. Uh, I just really, he's, a, I mean, and that actually, Matt Men is your best show, in my opinion. So I'm glad that oh, you spoke you. so much more I'll on pass that. it on to Mark. Like, I genuinely, though, like, you know, not to be too gushy, but Mark is a pleasure to work with because he he really knows what he's doing. He takes the comedy very seriously and he's a very, very talented writer and actor. Like he he makes the job very easy. Like I'll bring a script to him that's not quite polished and he'll make it funnier. He'll spot where the jokes could be and put them in. So uh, hopefully long may it continue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, cool. Um, I didn't know he was an actual geography teacher. That kind of tripped me out. That's he's not anymore. So he now, his proper full-time job is uh, he works as a serious documentary producer. So, oh, um, his work is on the actual proper television. And then in his spare time, he works on Mat Men. BBC Four? Um, not necessarily. He, uh, <laughs> no, I, don't, he, uh, I don't even know what BBC Four is. What's the what's the content on BBC Four primarily? What's that? Well, there's a, there's a question. Um, BBC Four is technically, it's the brainy channel. It's where you get documentaries and stuff that's no. not quite as sensationalist as you get on BBC Three. Oh. Just to sort of um, explain the channels in a sound, BBC One, BBC Two, BBC Three, BBC Four. <laughs> what? What? what uh, which one is top of the pops on, or it used to be on? Uh, ooh, well, back you, back in the, in those days, it would have been on BBC One. But nowadays, really? the only time you'd ever see Top of the Pops would be if it's on repeats, and therefore, it actually belongs on BBC Four because it's you know Top of the Pops is now a history documentary. History, that's right. Because yeah. I do a lot of I, my other channel is music history, and so I'm, I kind of, you know, went down some rabbit holes about Top of the Pops before. Um, well, of course, right. as you know, as you've surely come across in your research, um, many, many, many episodes of Top of the Pops can no longer be shown, and you're free to go and Google why. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's move swiftly <laughs> on. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Good uh, transition. So. Uh, 
believe it is your turn. It's my turn for question five. Question five is... I'm starting to talk like you. It's your turn. Yeah, sorry. It's my turn. Uh, it's quite similar to the pre... I didn't put these in a very good order, by the way. So this is a similar question to the previous one. Question five. You know rather a lot about how every US president died. It must surely have got you thinking, what would be your ideal death? Where are you? What are you doing? And how are you disposed of? And how are you remembered? Uh, painless. Um, <laughs> I, and honestly, I don't care after I'm, I mean, I, I think part of the reason why a lot of people are driven in life is they do, whether they like to admit it or not, they think about their legacy because it's the closest thing we have to immortality. Uh, it's like, hey, I may not be around in 200 years, but maybe something I came up with will still be known in 200 years. Uh, and so that's kind of a nice thought. But at the end of the day, I'm just like, when I'm dead, I'm dead. I don't really care. I mean, I, I've already, we've made a wills. I said, hey, I just want to cheap, make it cheap, you know, uh, which usually that means uh, cremate it. Um, but as far as like painless death, I mean, heck, you can even have a, um, you can even have, uh, what is it? What's the a dopamine death where it feels good? Uh, apparently, supposedly, <laughs> when you when you drown, drowning actually uh, is it feels good to drown. But right before you die. How do they know? But also. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Why not? have Why not have pleasure when you're dying? Um, but I think most people will say that, you know, die in your sleep. And did which, I answer your question? Which U.S. president do you think had the best death? Oh, oh, that was the other part. Uh, so um, Thomas Jefferson had a horrible death. Um, he had like intestinal problems, uh, really bad. Just it just kept kept coming out. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, um, we don't know a lot about the recent president. I think I'm pretty sure uh, George H.W. Bush. That's the, the older George Bush the, of the uh the early nineties, late eighties. Um, I think he had a rather peaceful death. So I think, uh, um, what was this official cause? I don't remember, but he was in his nineties, you know, and I, he was on pain medication, you know, that's, so, the, way that's the thing, like, you know, before, um, the, the 1900s, I don't think I want to die before the 1900s. You know, you don't have the medication that we do today to make it not so bad. You don't have hospice, <laughs> Or I, you don't even probably know what hospice is. Um, oh, we have we, hospices, yeah. Oh, you do? Okay, I, I, I thought that was only an American thing. Uh, yeah, so I think that's a, that's one of the, the good things about, um, it's like, okay, even if you have a terminal illness, they can do whatever they can to make sure that, you know, you can at least live your last days. Um, not it sounds like you have thought about it. I think about death all the time. I really <laughs> do. <laughs> yeah. You get to a certain age, and yeah, so what do you think about Oh, I was thinking about it when I was a kid. I'm weird, but like, well, no, because my parents believe that when you die, uh, I, I grew up very religious, and they believe that when you die, wherever you go, you go there forever. That was the first time I kept saying, I, I remember like just staring off into space, like thinking for a long time, what what is forever? Like, holy crap, forever? That is it. Really, it's a terrifying thing to tell a child. <laughs> it is. To me, the most terrifying thing is forever. I, I don't want to. I don't want anything to be forever. So I think uh, there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, accepting that everything ends. I think is actually really comforting to me. What are your thoughts on death, Jay Foreman? Very similar to yours, actually. I think uh, I agree with you that you know this is the one life, and you better live it good. And um, on the one hand, I'd like it to be a nice, painless death, but also there's maybe there's something cool about going down in a ball of flames. Um, I did for a while. Somebody asked me what my funeral should be. And the answer I gave, and I think I should stick to it, is that um, there should be a balloon of my face sort of floating in the wind. And uh, the music that I definitely want at my funeral. Actually, no, I am sure about this. The music I want at my funeral, and I want everyone to stand very still and sudden for this music, is The Spanish Flea by Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. And I don't want any giggling throughout the song. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you have thought about this. I, yeah, I, I have not thought about the funeral. I, I did say um, it would be nice at my funeral if you played like, a, you know, maybe a song that I made, I recorded, you know, I've recorded a lot of music and it'd be kind of cool if you, because, you know, I can't get friends and family to listen to my music right now. <laughs> so at least maybe you have to listen to me now. Exactly. You have to, you have to listen to my funeral. So. 
Um, we had a, there's a, I wanted to put this comment up real quick. It's just a, uh, he's from England. He's been watching my channel bit. since the early days. So shout out to Cyvlog, but um, he wanted to know what your favorite U.S. president was. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm not very good at my knowledge of U.S. presidents. I mean, I learned a lot about um, the founding fathers of the U.S. by watching Hamilton, and I wasn't even really concentrating. Um, my favorite in living memory is Barack Obama. Um, I wonder if I can go with some sort of hybrid where, let's say, in many years' time, Barack Obama gets very bored, decides to take up a career in acting, and plays Thomas Jefferson in Hamilton. I'd enjoy that. <laughs> All right. No, yeah, I don't know very many um, prime ministers either. Like, I I mean, I think most Americans... There's would... lots of YouTubeable stuff about uh, UK prime ministers. But, you know, I mean, again, to warn you, it's a hell of a rabbit hole. Oh, yeah, I, I'm sure. I mean, that's... But the uh, people want me to make videos about um, every, you know, prime minister of, of, of the UK. And I'm just like, hey, look, I, I can barely keep up with all the American content and I don't know much about it. So I And also, I think if you're making a video about anything, you shouldn't be one Wikipedia article ahead of your own video. It should be exactly. something that you already know loads about and you can conceivably be one of the best people to talk about it. So that's why you should do US presidents and then maybe somebody else, you know, a British person should do uh, British prime ministers. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's a London infrastructure and very little else. <laughs> that, that's the only, I'm not an expert on anything really, but that's the closest I get is like Amer American <laughs> presidential history. Yeah. Like, all right. Uh, the, the irony is actually, I say you shouldn't ever be one piece of research ahead, but you know, one of the best ways to become an expert on something is to make a YouTube video about it. And then the paradox of course, is that the best way to make sure you've got all your facts, right. Is to upload a YouTube video and then watch all the corrections come flooding into the comments section. <laughs> Yeah, it's humbling. That that's truly humbling. Uh, it's not humbling when you get when so people say, "Oh, it's so humbling." I won all these awards and got all these views. No, no, that's that boosts your ego. But yeah, I honestly, I think we need our e egos to be deflated, and I, I that's why I read comments. I'm just like, "Hey, um, come on, just punch me," you know, <laughs> I mean. Um, okay, so this is kind of related to the last one here, but I, you know, I know a lot about you. Don't have to creep you out, but I know that uh, that you've worked with your brother. Uh, oh, yeah. And so, yeah, I just want to, and uh, I also, I didn't know this until recently, that your brother's also a DJ. Is that He's right? A, well, it's hard to describe his job. So he is a beatboxer and musician. If you Google Beardy Man, that's the name he trades under, he is one of the most talented musicians in the whole wide world. He's amazing. Mind you, I would say that because I'm his brother and I really like him. But um, his <laughs> shtick is he goes on stage with his equipment, which is a few iPads plugged into each other, and then uses it to sample his own voice and then voices from the audience and from wherever he gets it to make music instantly in real time. And it's amazing. And it's also really funny. So I highly recommend you check out um, his channel, Beardy Man. Um, he is um, like sort of similar to what I do in that it's a hybrid between music and funny. I say that. It's a it's similar to what I used to do before I started doing the documentaries about infrastructure. But um, yeah, he and I are um, quite literally from the same womb. So we're bound to have something in common. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Yeah, no. And my brother and I have worked... Like we have another channel that nobody knows about called Zany Time, where it's just uh, absurdist uh, comedy skits, sketches, um, and uh, we most people don't think it's funny, but we do. And we, and he, he's also made, he's made appearances in my videos too. And people don't know he's my brother because he well, doesn't. The two of you enjoy it. We share a, we share a womb as well, but yeah, like uh, he do, he doesn't look like me. He looks more like um, I think my mom. And so the thing is, uh, our mom, um, but it's. There is something about working with your brother creativity. Like it seems like you can like skip a bunch of steps. So I wanted to ask ask you like because I know you've worked, he's been in or he's worked with you on your videos. How was that like working? We've we've actually we've not worked together anywhere near as much as I'd like to because like we're um, always busy at different times. So um, when I was getting started making videos, he just had his kids, and now vice versa. 
Um, so when we have worked together, it's been very brief. Like he'd be doing a live show and for a one-off, he'd bring me on stage to do just a little bit of improv or a little bit of um, playing my guitar. And then I put him in my videos a couple of times for like little cameo roles. But what we've, we've talked for years about doing something a lot more um, intense together with he and I sort of showing off our weird skills a lot more. Um, but we don't know where we'd put it because there's actually a very thin slither of the Venn diagram, people who like my stuff and people who like his stuff. So if we make something together and it would be weird, where would we put it? Like Darren and I have said, uh, his real name is Darren, by the way, and we've often said that um, we are a bad influence on each other and we need each other not being there <laughs> to sort of hone us in and make stuff more commercial. He actually, we, we, Darren and I were talking about this really recently. He, um, he mentioned, he was on the phone to me today, that one of his favorite things that I've ever done is a video that I unlisted a very long time ago because it's absolute batshit, and I'm never telling you what it is. Oh, man. That's too bad. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'll find out. No, it's good. <laughs> That's cool, though. But, yeah, I, you know, uh, I sad to say my brother and I have not collaborated much in recent years either. And, it's, yeah, you, you know, life gets in the way, and he has, uh, he works a lot of hours in his job, and, um families you know that's what really matters right uh i mean my, lots of members of my family are in my videos so um my dad uh played the part of a um i can't actually remember the name of what we called him in the video when I, there's a bit where i'm standing on the banks of the river thames saying that the company of water and enlightenment they worry man that's the word uh, the company of water and enlightenment are still around today and i've got an interview with one here and i cut off really? the say anything uh that's not a real wearman that's my dad um my mum's been in the video um she was sitting on the toilet um whilst talking about bus fares um i my remember that i remember that video yeah my mum and then my, sister, mom. Uh, my sister's been in videos a couple of times that she had a, she shared a scene with um we had tomska do a cameo and uh it was him and my sister and it's a bit where um one by one people are reading they're reacting to some news in the newspaper and they're all spitting their coffee and then in the scene where it's my sister and Tomska, um, he sips the coffee, but then she spits in his face. So yeah, all, various members of my family have been in my videos. So your and, sister spit in the face of Tom Scott? Tomska. No, I, it's weird how Tom Scott and Tomska have got such similar names, but they oh, do such different Tom, things on the internet. How do you spell that? Tom, Tom. Tomska is T-O-M-S-K-A, who is a sketch comedian. Oh, and okay, Tom okay. Scott is the um uh, the educational youtuber wow okay i've never heard of tom scub but now i know Do check him out. he's very good as well <laughs> awesome all right is it time for my question six or was that my question six just now i've lost track it happens no that's why i have this little tracker thing um i believe it is your turn <laughs> literally this is for me because it gets out of con out of control if we don't have that well, let's see. I'll get my sixth question good and ready. Yeah, it's indeed it is my go. I might be jumping the gun. Oh, I like this question. I'm looking forward to this. Is it my question? It is. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> what is your favorite thing that you've ever owned on VHS? It totally counts if it was recorded off the TV at home. Well, I got rid of it all. It's so sad. Um, but what, does it matter that if I got rid of it? Not at all. The question was, what's your favorite thing that you have ever owned on oh, VHS? Did I miss it? So even if you had it from Blockbuster for five minutes, that still counts. When I was a kid, uh, my favorite um, uh, comic strip was Garfield. Yeah, like, uh, and oh, you like Garfield too? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know if it stands up. I loved it as a kid, but well, I haven't kept up with like I know there's like a new Garfield movie coming out that you know probably take your kids to see in a couple years, but like. Um, I watched the original animated series and I believe Bill Murray might have, or somebody that sounded like Bill Murray. No, so music Sounds like Bill Murray, but isn't. Yeah. He sounded just like Bill Murray, but he was the one who d did the voice of Garfield. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, it was the show. And I, I recorded every episode onto these really crappy VHS tapes. And cause you, and I, uh, and then like, you can't find it hardly anywhere the, this the original anime series i checked on youtube and there's a few people that uploaded some episodes um but you also can't stream it like i can't find it streaming it's a real shame, because there's definitely an appetite out there for you know at least garfield if not orson's farm well i mean maybe that's changed because i know they've expanded a lot of the the free free content you know with ads 
Um, we have to yeah. wait until uh, 2174 when Garfield becomes public domain. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, here in the United States, it's usually 75 years. The only reason why Mickey Mouse, Steamboat Willie, had extra time was because Disney went to uh, the federal courts and mm. they made the case because, oh, Mickey Mouse. And so, anyway. Uh, but, yeah, steam. Let's, we should watch some Steamboat Willie. Um, I was okay. considering on the day that they made it public domain, just uploading Steamboat Willie to my channel because I can, can't. I? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, if you know, if you can't release the video this month. <laughs> okay, you're gonna. My next question is is really weird. Um, oh, I like these. Are you ready for this? Okay, I'm ready. Would you be willing to have a map off with me? Yes, yes, please. Let's have a map. <laughs> What's okay. So specifically, yeah, like uh, you're a map man, so I figured this would be. Oh, okay. wait, is this, this going to bite me in the ass because it's a? No, I, I of him, well, I know maps, and I might not know them well at all. Oh, come on, please! I saw you draw England. You and Mark were on the the paper. I don't remember which video it was, but you drew England by memory, and you did it quite well. Um, do you have a piece of, of paper and pen handy, uh, per chance? Um, no, but I've got a um, quality street matchmaker. And I can draw using a chocolate stick onto. In fact, give me five minutes. I can go and get a real piece five of. Minutes. Give me I two. I tell you what, um, Jade. No, can I rotate the camera to you so that you can entertain the audience by singing a song while I go and find a piece of paper and pen? She says it's just not going to happen. Um, what I need you to do, uh, Mr. Yeah, B, for I can just the next thirty seconds, pretend you're talking to me by doing your voice and my voice, and I'll be right back with a piece of paper. This is what people came to see. All right, well. Jay Foreman will be with you imminently. While we're doing that. The 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 Thank you, Stan. I like parliamentary better than presidential. Oh, you. Ah, got it. Well, there we go. Go. Less than 30 seconds. That's impressive. And I've got a piece of paper and pen as well. Right. What's a map? Beforehand? I'm so sorry. Yeah. I, so I got mine. Um, and so we know there's no shenanigans here. But um, so here's the challenge. Okay. Um, at, at, uh, in approximately, um, I would say, well, yeah, we should say 30 seconds. Why not? It doesn't matter. Just as quick as you can. Draw. Working with busy schedules. Draw what you're gonna do is draw England by memory, and I'm gonna draw um, the United States by memory. Okay. No, no disrespect. Uh, and can you sing some uh, background music? To <laughs> I got here. I got. Uh, hold on. Uh, He's asking me to draw a map, and I'm worried that it's gonna be 30 seconds of dead air. Well, that's better. Uh, right, here, we here we go. Go. And we'll see how this. Ah, my pen's running out. Finished. <laughs> you beat me. Oh, oh no, I forgot the Isle of Wight. Now I'm finished. Oh, that's a fair point. All right. Hang on. Jade has very sensibly pointed out where's Northern Ireland. So I've just added, right. Now I'm finished. <laughs> Shall we oh, reveal all, on screen? All the UK? Okay. On the three. One, One, two, two three. three. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. So look at look at that. Well, yours is better than mine because you've actually labeled it, which means your map really is of something. Um, whereas mine, um, it could be anything. In fact, I don't know what, I could cheat it slightly. I think I've made East Anglia, I put it too low down. I've made it look like Britain has let itself go. And it's sort of like, you know, East Anglia has flumped down. So if I rotate it somewhat, Northern Ireland's too small. Isle of Man is missing. Scottish Islands are missing, which I'll get in big trouble for. Devon and Cornwall look wrong. Also, my pen's run out. How do we decide the winner? 
You won. Uh, you you, you <laughs> won, no doubt. I just I, the reason why I did this is because I'm so impressed by how you're able to do this by memory. And I mean, look at my West Coast for crying out loud. It's it's a it's like a straight, straight line. line, basically a straight line. I got lazy at the end there. Um, yeah, that is uh, amazing. Uh, oh, so I guess, I guess related to this is like, how are you able to do that? Like, did you do this as a kid just yeah, over yeah. and over? It's a sort of cheating if I was interested in it from a very young age and would just doodle maps all the time. And, you know, I'd, I had the sort of brain as a kid that would take that kind of information in, but I'd forget where I left my glasses. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I used to have my students, uh, when I taught geography, I had my students actually do mental maps, and, but they only had to do the, um, the county. And they were, I mean, I'm like, okay, where, where do all the cities go in our county, like the major cities? And they were all over the place. Like so many people can't, you know, they they just can't do that. They don't really, especially with GPS these days, uh, your phone tells you where you need to go everywhere you need oh, yeah. the time. And what's the I, need of knowing where places are? I, right? I do believe that, that people nowadays are less good at reading maps because they don't have to be. It used to be everyone had an atlas in the car and now everyone uses a sat nav, even people that know their way around they use a sat nav because it knows where the traffic is. And so, you know, you have no option but to know your area not as well as you would have to. It used to be a very simple, basic requirement to learn the map of where you live. And now there are people that, you know, they don't know which way north is in their own town. Does that worry you? I wonder if that's like, maybe- it doesn't worry me, but I think it's a sad thing. I think, you know, I mean, there's a trade off. Like what we've gained is everyone being able to find their way around. And it's un unbelievably useful having GPS. We've lost something, but you know, you know, when cars got invented, we lost horses. You know, it's swings and roundabouts. Yeah, I, I go back and forth on that. I think a lot of it. Yeah, I do remember um, going on road trips and with the giant uh, Randy Ram McNally atlas and like outlining where we were from town to town. Uh, that was a. Oh, somebody uh, saw your brother in L.A. Beardy man, that's cool. And and Los Angeles in 2015. So, I didn't know that I went to LA in 2015. <laughs> yeah, well, pass, you know, pass the word. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, anyway, well, thanks for doing that. That was ridiculous. And oh, thanks. All right. So yeah, it's your turn. <laughs> it's my turn. We're up to question. Where's my phone? Here we go. Question eight. No, question seven. I feel like we've answered this one already. Question seven is: What do you think YouTube and indeed your career will look like ten years in the future? So I think we've talked about ourselves well, enough. I wonder if this should be a question. I've Here's what I'd like you to tell me is, what do you think the website youtube.com will look like in the year 2034? It will be youtube.video. No, no. Shout out to your episode about domain names. Uh, I think that YouTube is actually going to be, it's going to last a long time. And the reason why I say that is because it's so dominant right now. Like after Google, it's it's the number two site. Uh, it, when you search for things, it pops right up. Even with other search engines, um, that kind of momentum I don't think just disappears, you know, overnight. Yeah. But I guess it's also a question of that. Yeah, I'm, I don't doubt that in ten years' time there will still be YouTube, the website. But will it still be used for the same thing? Will it still? Oh, will doing YouTube for a living mean the same thing in ten years' time from now? It I mean, be, maybe Elon Musk will buy it and do horrible things to it. We don't know. Gosh, don't even joke around about that. <laughs> I hope uh, that would be horrifying if he did. But yeah, um, I think it will be. I mean, we we tend to not bring this up enough that a lot of I mean, Generation Z, the whole generation, they didn't grow up uh, watching network television um, like we did when we were kids uh, or cable t television even or. Um, even you know pay-per-view they watched youtube and tiktok those are the two yeah. and i think the tiktok is only for um honestly a lot of younger folks don't even i think get the same satisfaction as they used to on tiktok on, on short form content in general like they they kind of crave that longer form content and i think also the trend that's changing is if you look at the data more and more people are watching it uh youtube on tv versus um their phone or computer and I think that's just going to continue to shift over to like TV is going to be, it's going to become more of something, oh, we're just on the couch and that's that's on versus like we're all individually. Because on, on your phone, it's more, uh, I think, you know, it's more TikTok or shorts. Um, so I, I just think it's going to be a, it's going to be network television in 10 years. Right? 
that's really reassuring to hear. I feel the same way, but you know, I daren't dream it because it means that I might still have a career in 10 years time. Um, I mean, I am really worried about TikTok taking over and people just not having the time to watch longer videos because you know, the, the way to make stuff and watch stuff is short form, short form, short form. But hopefully you're absolutely right. And that there will always be a place for longer stuff and people could watch it on the big screen on the wall that we still call the TV. Um, so they say, so yeah, hopefully yeah, we will still be here. I think it's kind of like junk food, TikTok or short form contents, junk food. People, um, a lot of people kind of grow tired of junk food. They want to be get a healthier diet of longer form stuff, podcasts. Yeah, I think the sort of thing that you and I do, YouTube is currently, and I think for some time will remain the best place for it. But I think if you're doing zany stuff, sketches, pranks, and the sort of things that I'm not terribly interested in, whereas that's what YouTube was best for, that now belongs to TikTok or whatever's coming next. But I think, I hope, we'll be okay. Yeah, and if we not, we'll we'll find something else. I know that people always bring up Vine, how that died, and then but yeah. they they all pivoted over to YouTube and TikTok. And the thing is, if you're creative enough, you'll it doesn't matter like what the platform is, and, and at least some of your audience will follow you. Um, it is terrifying though. Yeah, I never take this job for granted. I've only been doing it full time since 2021, and uh, I'm always prepared to go back to teaching. I'm you know I've got a I mean, if I, I I'm license, I'm a licensed teacher. <laughs> so if I need to go back to the classroom, I'm fully prepared to do it tomorrow. But um, that's how you kind of got to view things, I think, because otherwise it's like it, it still doesn't seem like this is a real job. Like, oh, you can just do oh, absolutely it. not. <laughs> I, still, I still need to work out what my um, fallback um, proper job would be if I got fired from YouTube tomorrow. Maybe I could get a job as a chartered quantity surveyor or a systems analyst. You'd be a comedian. Well. <laughs> who would fire you? <laughs> who would everybody? everybody. My one point five million bosses. That's right. That's that's true. Like, I, and I, oh yeah, there have been YouTubers recently. Yeah, that have been like uh, H Bomber guy. That that did you hear about all that? Hours of it. Yeah, great stuff. Yeah, I mean, I was just thankful that I wasn't in the video. I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I don't plagiarize. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. I think it's my turn here. Uh, I think. Yes, it is. All right. Eighth question. Oh, we're making pretty good time, actually. I don't feel so bad. Okay, I'll keep you up for a few more hours. So. <laughs> um, well, this is related to, I, I know this, I should have brought this up earlier, but um, some of the first videos I did watch of yours were the politics videos. And, and you know, that's my bread and butter. I'm really interested in that more than anything. Uh, so, one thing we have in common with uh, the UK is first past the post voting. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I just triggered you. Uh, do you uh, do you predict that will ever go away? And it seems because I mean, and why or why not? Because it, it seems um, like so many people hate it. People do hate it, but the people who hate it are a small and vocal minority, and the vast majority of people don't really give it much thought. And the super depressing thing is, we used to have a small smattering of a fairer voting system. Uh, in the London Assembly and London mayoral elections, the last time we had an election, we had a second preference system where you can put your genuine first choice first and a so-called safe choice second. And then they very quietly got rid of that. So if you support one of the smaller parties, you now have no option but to take a risk that your vote will be wasted or you have to vote safely. And that's, I think it's terribly sad. Because it means that, well, you know full well, that it means that the um, makeup of the assembly is not going to be how Londoners actually feel. It's going to favour the two biggest parties, as first past the post always does. And what makes me so miserable is that that huge change was announced to very little fanfare, and people weren't, as I believe they should be, up in arms about it. Obviously, the small parties, like the Green Party, for example, like they're quite rightly uh, pointing out how ridiculously unfair it is. But... Labour are quiet about it, obviously, and the Conservatives are quiet about it, and much more depressingly, so seems to be everybody else. And therefore, I think, will first past the post go in my lifetime? Is there going to be any meaningful change for how we pretend to do democracy in this country? No. And I'm sorry to end on a downer, but that, that's how I feel about democracy in this country, and that's why I can't make that series anymore, because I'm too furious. Uh just yesterday, I was talking to my daughters about the royal family, and uh, I was kind of ranting and raving, you know, like, oh, I don't, 
everybody's equal. Don't you ever think that anyone is better than you? And that kind of got philosophical too. But I'm just like, it seems to me like everything, I, I do follow um, what a lot of younger um, British pundits on YouTube at least are saying about the royal family and about the, because the, it is like, uh, there's a, about uh, the ones who wear the robes, the, what are that, what's that called again? House of Lords. House of Lords, yes. Uh, it's so ridiculous. Like, it, and, and everybody, it like, what makes it angry, they're like, why are we doing this still? Yeah, what makes me furious is that, to my mind, it's really, really obvious. Like, it's sort of, it goes without saying that it's, you know, so Dungeons and Dragons nonsense. And I did a video um, in one of my very first Politics on Boring, where I said, what something I thought was incredibly sensible and normal, which was, isn't that crazy? And I had all these people leaving comments going, well, you've shown your colors. You're clearly a Republican, which in the UK means anti-monarchy. And, you know, how dare you say such a disrespectful thing? Like, mate, you're the weird one for thinking it's weird that I think it's weird that we have a monarchy. We need to talk about something that's going to make me happy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, they're just Tories. It's okay. Um, but they're in charge. Anyway, anyway, um, happy thoughts. Well, happy that's, I think at the root of it, though, is a larger thing. I, I try to tell everybody about this is that it's not really it's about um, concentration of wealth more than anything. I think once we see that, like we, we have to attack the root cause of everything else will come into place. But also there you could say that um, if we attack the root cause, like with voting reforms, because in the United States, it's the same situation. We have gerrymandering. We mm -hmm. have um, the Electoral College to like the president. Um, I mean, that's how we got a, some very unpopular presidents in recent years. Um, and so, like, I think if you tackle the voting thing, then everything else will fall into place. But also at the same time, paradoxically, paradoxically, if you attack the concentration of wealth, everything else will fall in line. So it's either one of those two things you have to reform. If you unravel the things that are unfair in society and you try and build from the ground up and create, you know, how would you build a country? How would you build society from scratch? without any precedent for how things have been done for centuries. There are so, excuse me, there are so many things that you'd never do. You wouldn't have cheese, for example. Who'd think of cheese? <laughs> first time. It seems so unsafe. How dare you? I love cheese, Noski. Me too. Uh, but you wouldn't invent it. Well, imagine there was no such thing as cheese, and then someone suggested you eat some. Do you want it? Yeah, you'd be like, is that, that doesn't look edible to me, yeah. Well, it was milk. It's gone so off that it's solid. Don't worry. The really strong smell is a good thing. Would you like it on toast? <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, that's the thing. It's the same thing with, I mean, so many, I, I always say like um, the, the politicians that we admire um, from yesteryear. So from previous, not only decades, but centuries that were true forward thinkers, if they were here today, I truly think most of them would be just in shock that we like this is how far you've gotten like this is why didn't you change all those things we came up with back then like yeah um, it is it is infuriating because um i just think that so many people benefit from things just being the way they are that it's like you know no one wants to like kind of take it for the team they just want to uh, that might hurt my family's well, inheritance well, what can we do <laughs> what can we do to make the world a better place well, but honestly, I think we're in a good position. I mean, I think a lot of, I saw, um, I had the, I was lucky to see Neil deGrasse Tyson in person uh, at a YouTube conference last fall. Um, that's also where I was like, I was like starstruck because I got to meet the oversimplified guys who were very mysterious. And, uh, but Neil deGrasse Tyson gave a speech in front of, there's just like a hundred of us. Um, and he said, in this room right now, there, all of you collectively have billions of views and I want you to think about the impact that you're going to have, not on the the ones in charge now, but the ones going to who, who are going to be in charge in a generation. You know, like the 12 year old who's watching us right now, they are going to be in charge one day. And I'm not just saying in charge of a company; they may be in charge of a country. And so I think that's the where I kind of constantly uh, try to like, you know, uplift myself, be more optimistic, is thinking about. Um, because I do have a lot of faith. I feel like I'm saying this a lot in these episodes. It's like, I have a lot of faith in the younger folks. Maybe too much faith, but uh, are you cynical with them as well? These these young parts or no? No, I think they'll do a better job of looking after the planet than my generation has. Um, but it sounds like what you're saying is, in order to make the world a better place, 
we just got to carry on doing exactly what we're doing already. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I just think I have, I don't know. I just, I think I, I don't mean to like burst or like to uh, inflate our egos now, but I think what we're, what we do is we're able to do what our teachers didn't do for us, which is make stuff that's boring about educational stuff, make it exciting and accessible to an audience that would not see it otherwise. And I think that to say that, you know, if I was, for example, to make a video about how furious I was about them changing the electoral system, and if I was able to get many millions of people to watch that, and then maybe more people could watch that. And then in a generation's time, there'd be more people who could make more people angry about it. And then from little seeds do big changes come. But in the meantime, yeah. we can just sit at home and watch the news and grumble about the Tories and Brexit. <laughs> Don't watch the news. That's start with that. It's pointless anyway. <laughs> All right. We we need, to... You have an uplifting question or something that's not related to politics? Oh, see, my question eight is because uh, I don't remember. Question eight. Oh, here's a good one. What is the smallest aircraft you've ever been in? I did not expect that. Uh, uh, aircraft. Well, I, I, I was in one of those little planes. Uh, the, only five of us were in it. Um, this is when I was a kid. Uh, I think that's the smallest aircraft I've been in. Yeah, we. Uh, it was terrifying. I um, because I that before I had flown in a commercial plane, like the, one of the big ones, I flew. I flew in one of those, and I remember thinking, like, "Oh, I'm going to die." Um, like, <laughs> a lot of turbulence in a small plane. Uh, yeah, it's always, I was, it's always worrying when you can feel the rumble of the engine in the plane you're in. Yeah, yeah. It was so loud. I remember how loud it was. I was like, because I couldn't even like tell someone, the person next to me, it was another uh, student. It was uh, a few students that were, uh, I, I couldn't tell that him that uh, I felt like, I'm, we're going to die. You know, I, he couldn't hear me. That was another part, terrifying part of it. Um, you couldn't console. And I was, I think, at 10 oh, or 11. Rather a lot tonight, hasn't it? <laughs> uh, that's just me. I'm sorry. <laughs> what about you? What's the smallest aircraft you've been in? My answer for a while was um, I flew from Manchester to the Isle of Man in a plane that was basically a bus and it had like a two seats on one side of the aisle and one seat on the other. And like I swear you could hear it starting up with like a lawnmower motor. Um, but then I broke that record a couple of years ago. Um, Tom Scott invited me onto his channel to be flown around in a teeny tiny plane where I basically had to pilot it. Was that a was video? Loads of fun. And what's that? Was, was that a video or was that just something? Yeah. Uh, oh, when I Tom I started know. his channel, Tom Scott Plus, and he has like other people from the internet to sort of do fun things with him. And he had me on the first one flying teeny tiny planes around, which was great fun. And I was sick. Wow, I didn't know about there's, this. There's footage of me being sick into a bag on the internet now. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, here. I tried aerobot aerobatics with Jay Foreman and neither of us could handle it. Yeah, Ooh. I was sick. He passed out. Oh, wow. Well, spoiler alert. I'll have to check this out later. Yeah, this is, that is a small plane. It now means that I need to try and break that record and fly in something even smaller, which I guess is going to have to be a jetpack. Oh, yeah. Jetpack. Uh, oh, do it and turn it into a video. Um, How does course, it have to be educating about London infrastructure while I do it? So I think I'd have to use it while like hovering over London and pointing down at the railways. Oh, oh look, no. it's me from two years ago. Ah, uh, yeah, you look so much younger before the poor kids. No, yeah, <laughs> um, I don't understand how Tom had like does all these things that are just ridiculous. Like, does he just email the, the people? And because I every I can't even like I email museums and I can't even get them to respond back. And then he's he's out there like, oh yeah, we're gonna, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna be lifted by a helicopter for my last video. Um, I, just I guess you just got to be polite in the email. You know, you got to say yours sincerely. Paid for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he did pay for that. <laughs> I'm sure he did. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll have to watch that one later. I had no idea. I His channel's going to get flagged now from uh, this video. It says, did you know 0. something percent of their video was from your channel? You can have us taken down. Oh, please note. Please don't know. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I was not expecting that question. So let's uh, let's go with this. We have two more? Yeah. Let's see. Is it my eighth question or my ninth oh, question? It's my it's my oh, your ninth question. Okay. I've just realized my question 10 has definitely been answered. So I need to think urgently of a new question 10. Okay. Um, well, 
encourage someone from the audience watching to suggest my question 10 in case I can't think of one. But in the meantime, what is your question nine? Um, okay. Draw it. What? Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll do this one. This is a silly question, but it's also kind of a, a sneaky way of asking you about the United States. Um, which is better, York or New York and why? Depends what for. I mean, if you want to go for a trip up um, Clifford's Tower, walk around the historic walls, don't go to New York. It's the wrong place. Um, <laughs> they're so different. It's amazing that they have so much of their name in common. There used to be a T-shirt I saw when I was, I was at York. Um, I was at uni in York, um, proper old York. Right. Oh, I bring that up because, yeah, because I knew that you went to uni. Oh, in I lived in York for years. I'd love that yeah, place. Yeah. And then there was a T-shirt people used to wear a lot that said, I heart NY. And it says, I love North Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> and York is a fantastic place if you already live in this country to be a student. Um, but New York is surely the greatest place in the world, and I'd love it there, and I'd love to go back more often. That's where that conference was, where Neil deGrasse Tyson was. Yeah, it was. I, yeah, I've only been there a couple of times. Have you been to uh, America? Yeah, yeah, a few times. I uh, oh, no, twice actually. Um, I went once in 1996 when I was 11 years old to New York and then Disney World with my family. Uh, and then my second visit to the US was um, when I was just turning 30 and I decided to, me and a friend of mine did a road trip where we flew into New York City and then hired a car and deliberately didn't plan where we were going. We just had to make sure that we were in Dallas, Fort Worth two and a half weeks later. So we had all of that bit of America to sort of drive around and make it up as we went along and explore. And that was a great time. And then we flew home and realized, oh, we should have done research. Look at all these places we could have gone to. I know. It's well, I know actually Tom has done that. He's just kind of off the beaten path places in the United States. He's like, I'm just going to spend a few weeks there. And then he turned oh, and that does, doesn't do it anymore. But uh, yeah, that's how he planned his videos. And so did you, do you even remember which states you went through? We went through quite a lot of them. Let's if I can remember my route. So actually we started in Canada. We landed in Montreal, took an oh. overnight bus into New York City. Um, I regret that bus because um, oh, I couldn't sleep or stay awake. It was horrible. Uh, and then New York, New York What's that? State. You, you, you probably went through New York or, or New York State or Vermont, I imagine. Yes, but I slept through the whole thing because we wow. got on the bus at nighttime in Montreal and then woke up the next morning in New York City having passed through. Actually, no, at 3 a.m. we had to get up and do border control, um, that which was always fun. Let's see. Places we went on that road trip. Washington, D.C., the nice. bit of Pennsylvania where the Amish people live, um, <laughs> bits of Georgia. I think there was one state. I actually, this is a long time ago and I can't remember, but there was one state that we were in for less than an hour because we went the wrong way, but it means we added a state. Um, I think my highlight of that trip was New Orleans. I wasn't expecting to love it as much as I did, but New Orleans was great because um, it doesn't feel like anywhere else in America. Oh, the yeah. Really good. Oh, the food's the best. Yeah. Cajun food. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually never been there. Uh, embarrassingly, that's the one uh, I've only, there's five states I haven't been to. It's embarrassing. Oh, wow. to that. Yeah. Hawaii, Louisiana, Mississippi, which I was really close to Mississippi being in Memphis this year. Uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. Those are the five I have not been to. It's that's a surprise. You've been to Alaska and you've not been to New Orleans. Yeah. I, I've been to Alaska. My brother and I drove to Alaska. Uh, oh, around, wow. Yeah, this was in 2010 um, from Kansas City. So it was about, so actually, we only I only had 18 days off work. So I uh, I was a substitute teacher at the time, and it was during the summer, but I was also like a, a waiter at IHOP. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to time work because I got a teaching job. And I was like, I have 18 days. Let's drive all the way to Alaska and back in those 18 days. And that's, as it turns out, that's amazing. You'll know if you've watched the Simpsons movie, uh, you can walk from wherever Springfield is to Alaska in just a couple of days. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a video about Springfield. Why are there so many Springfields and where is the real Springfield? Uh, people say it's Oregon, by the way, because that's where Matt Grenig is from, the guy who created, created the Simpsons. It decided early on that there's no place it can be. And so, like, you know, every time you get a clue, yeah. all it is is a red herring that, you know, just spreads where the real Springfield is further and further apart. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah it is, it's still fun to try and guess. It's still fun to try and make. And I assume you've already done this, but, you know, to try and make a video that, you know, pinpoints exactly where the real Springfield must be, even though it can't <laughs> possibly exist. Yeah. No, it's. Because sometimes it's in the mountains, sometimes it's by the coast, sometimes it's uh, 
uh, overnight bus drive from New York City, and so on. Um, yeah, and that, the reason why there's so many Springfields actually is because of the original Springfield in Massachusetts was just so influential. People don't think about Springfield, Massachusetts; they think about Boston. But Springfield, the original, like it was one of the first settlements, and it was actually pretty influential back in the day. And so it's just kind of crazy. Well, but also like a lot of the earliest, uh, you know, American establishments were named after um, British establishment or cities, of course. So that's always fun to see. Usually it's new. Same way, because we went to Alabama and found a place called Birmingham with an H. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, Birmingham. Uh, no. Birmingham, Birmingham, that's how they say it. All right, I think you are up. All right, it is my question nine. My question nine is, how much would I have to pay you to eat an entire banana, including the skin? Oh, I do like bananas a lot, actually. Do you like the skin? Because no. I'm only paying you if you eat the skin as well. Um... Now, you're not allowed to just flat refuse because I assume that if it was a million dollars on the table, you'd take it. Oh, but yeah. I, I, I assume I, that, you know, you've got to name your price carefully because I, what I want to know is the exact amount, one penny below, you're saying no. What is the minimum that I'd have to pay you to eat an entire banana, including the skin? I mean, it, it won't kill you, will it? It's not poisonous. No, not at all. It's just really unpleasant. It's I a mean, small amount of money we're talking <laughs> There's that show Fear Factor where they did crap like this. You know, they got money if they ate disgusting things. Uh, Joe Rogan used to host it. I don't know if you know about that show, but uh, you remember reading there was a guy who ate a plane and it took him like years, but he very, very slowly <laughs> ate all the parts. No, I have no the idea. About I, I've been telling that story. I've been dining out on that for ages. And the more I think about it, the more that cannot be true. Actually, in the comments, if someone else knows, can you please tell me, is it true? Has a man eaten a plane? It's he has a Wikipedia page. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh wow. Here. Okay, so it's real. A man at your plane. Michael Lil Tito. Oh, look at that photo. Can you zoom into that photo of him at a dining chair? <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh, look at that guy. Look but at his what? face. Look how intense he is. Orson Wells. <laughs> he does look like Orson Wells. Uh oh, what, what president could he play? Uh $500. Who says five hundred dollars? Shannon. Shannon. Yeah. Uh, your oh. wife says five hundred dollars. <laughs> My first thought was a thousand. Um, the thing that, is, what, to eat a banana. How much did you pay? To eat a banana skin. Right. This is this is based on a true story, by the way. I was talking about this with my oh. brother-in-law. We were around at his house, and he was clearing up a banana skin. And then he said to me, "How much would you pay me to eat the? No, which way around was it? No, that is he said, "How much would you pay me to eat this no, banana skin?" No, he said, "How much should I have to oh, pay that, you to eat it?" He asked me how much. Um, he would have to pay me to eat a whole banana skin. I set my price at seventy-five pounds. <laughs> That's it. Well, what happened next was he then said seventy-five pounds is a lot. I would eat a banana, including the skin, for a tenner, ten pounds. Which is what's ten pounds in dollars? Let's find out. Oh, that's probably like fifteen bucks or something. It's not a lot. It's a small amount of money, um, and. Well, it so happens I had a tenner in my pocket and I gave it to him and I watched him eat the banana. Um, and it took oh, wow. ages and it was excruciating and one of the funniest things I've ever seen because he's a man of his word. He ate the whole thing. <laughs> oh, two hours. It took two hours? My sister had to reheat his dinner twice. Oh, yeah. And then, <laughs> oh. and then again, when his doctor called because they needed to talk about the tummy problems he was having. Oh, yeah. He, <laughs> like, oh, my so God. He was due to speak on the phone with a doctor that very evening about he's had stomach pain. So it's probably no wonder. But yeah, um, my brother-in-law would eat a banana skin for a tenner. I think £75 is about right because it's not going to kill you. It's just really unpleasant. And I could really do with £75. Here in the United States, we don't have universal health care. <laughs> like literally the first thought that I had was like, oh, what will the medical bill bill be if, you know, uh, like what will the insurance company not cover when we do when if I have to go to the ER because of this, you know? And so that's right, what I was thinking about. Now, how about let's see, what would I have to pay you to eat the skin of a satsuma? Now that's nowhere near as abrasive as a banana. It's much thinner, and you can use orange zest in cooking, so it should taste nice if a little bitter. And I think whatever you would charge for the banana skin, you should surely charge less 
for the skin of a satsuma or tangerine. Is, is it basically like an orange? Tastes like because very I, small little Christmassy, very like mini orange, like a satsuma or a tangerine or a clementine. Oh like, yeah, or whatever you want to call it, a little mini little orange. I do that for 20, 20 bucks. Yeah, twenty bucks. Okay, but I, I still lean higher. I would say yeah, at least closer to a thousand. I, let's say for a banana peel, I would say eight hundred and sixty-two dollars. <laughs> minimum specific eight hundred. Have you got something in yeah. mind you want to buy with the money? $862. Uh, well, <laughs> you wanted me to be specific. I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, the, I just, um, I do worry about side effects and stuff. Also like chemicals, you know, they spray chemicals on these. That's uh, true. Yeah. Cause good. when it comes to apples, they're very careful not to put chemicals on it because they know you're going to eat it. But with a banana, who knows what they clean it with? Who knows if they clean it at all? David Bennett said that he's oh, going to pay £75 on the Super Chat if uh, you eat a banana skin right now. David Bennett says he's going to pay £75 on the Super Chat if I eat a banana skin right now. <laughs> oh, well, you would have to get that money, so I I, I could just Venmo you. Um, but I... Doing this? Uh, you I mean, have a, I don't have I a banana. Have a I've, got a banana. I've got a banana. It took Stuart, it took two, Stuart hours. two hours. No, do you know what? It, mm. You've got covid I have got COVID. Which means I can do all the vitamin C I can get. There might be more vitamin C in a banana skin than there is in the actual banana on the inside. I want a working husband tomorrow. Right. My wife has pointed out that if I'm out of action tomorrow and not able to look after the children because of the banana, then I'd be in some trouble. So you can keep your money, David Bennett. <laughs> he said, he said, I'll yes, do it right now. <laughs> You mean you'll eat the banana? Well, we should get David on here. Um, Some other time, get him on. Um, apparently the there's a thing called banana peel bacon. That sounds kind of delicious. That actually. does sound nice. But again, that's been treated somewhat. Like I bet they put stuff in it and they fry it. Yeah. And they soften it. Oh, that, sound, that sounds really good, actually, banana peel bacon. I just remembered. I didn't say that you have to eat it there and then. I, In the terms and conditions, if you read the smoking... Oh. You could turn the banana peel into beautifully stewed soft banana peel bacon with maple syrup. Oh, if that's the case, case, I will gladly accept your seventy-five pounds, but it has to be cooked first. <laughs> forty-two. I'll do it for forty-two dollars. Uh, yeah, undercut. This is what makes it an interesting. Like you know, we actually have to undercut each other, and you know, only the person that bids the lowest will get the job. <laughs> like Task Rabbit. I wish I had a banana here. I, I would uh, mind even, but no, uh, I, I would feel guilty of something like, especially, yeah, I keep forgetting that you're sick right now. You have so a, how, how much would I have to pay you to eat an inflatable beavis? Oh, like that beavis? Yeah. Uh, inflatable. That's plastic. That, that could kill you. That could get stuck in your intestine. I don't want to No, Let's not even, oh, no. I'm not even, I'm not going to. David Bennett has just donated seventy-five pounds of his piano money because he wants me to eat a banana, banana peel. a banana peel, <laughs> and also worryingly, David and I actually have planned to do a video sometime later this year, which means he can make sure I do it. Um, this could be a great video idea. I will, uh, I will send you the Venmo. Make sure that because I do not deserve this money. If you do it, you deserve it. This I'll is tell me what's probably going to happen. Very likely, when David and I do this video that's coming later this year, if indeed it does happen, there may have to be a sample from this very video, which explains why, during the video, I'm eating a banana peel and being paid for it. He's paid up now. That's legit. Now, sometimes they get a refund afterwards, so I'll make sure that he doesn't do that. But wow, that's uh, I will make sure that you are uh, you are reimbursed for this. David, thank you so much. That's insane. That, uh, I think he's a big banana fan. I... In the meantime, I'm going to have to do some research on what is the... I mean, I'm not going to ask my brother-in-law because, you know, he had to phone the doctor with stomach pain and he took two hours. I'm going to have to do some research. If you do eat a banana peel, what is the best, safest, most delicious way to do it? <laughs> Small banana, fry it, roast it, soften it, break it up into tiny pieces. Apparently there's something called banana bacon. Banana, banana bacon. Yeah, we've been talking about banana peel bacon, yeah. yeah. But maybe I should eat it the same way the guy ate the plane, which is to open his mouth really wide and just eat it in one gollop. He also ate five bikes, apparently. 
I, I guess this is a thing. Like a lot of people eat banana peels. Maybe this is, really isn't that big of a deal. I, I've often paid to do it now. I've got to do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, let's follow up on this. Uh, we need to hold you accountable. And uh, I'm serious. I'm I'm going to get you this money. It's going to be legit. Uh, we're going to do it. We're going to. I feel guilty taking them all this money. Actually, it's really why do people pay me money? It's so weird. Uh, okay. Um, you asked. This is the well. I, this is something I was going to talk about in the olden days. You know, saying at the end of a video, "Please pay me," would have been awful, especially for people in this country. Like Brits are very bad at ask. You know, shilling and asking for money. But you know, the world has changed, and it's now perfectly acceptable to say, "If you like what you see, please pay me." And that benefits people like us. But, you know, in, in, in Britain, we are still very shy about it. We do still have to be a bit cagey when we ask for money. Yeah, donate to my Patreon or subscribe or like and share. That's a subtle, way, really subtle way of saying, hey, I need to pay the bills this month. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I get the comments, Mr. Breast, give me money all the time. So people want money from me. Uh, somebody was saying uh, YouTube just took 30% of that. 75 pounds, by the way. Then YouTube has to eat 30% of a banana peel. There we go. I'm going to say we have to get YouTube uh, involved in the banana, banana peeling uh, smorgasbord as well. Okay. Well, how do we even follow up with that? I don't think. Well, if it helps, I don't have a 10th question. Well, I had I one, but we've answered it before. So I need to scramble around and find a question urgently. And oh. perhaps the best way to do it is to take a book off my shelf, rifle quickly through the pages, and the first time I get to a sentence with a question mark, I will ask you that question. That works. Yeah. That, that's it? great. Let's go have a look. Uh, friends are there. I mean, there's no such thing as free will, right? So this is... Um, you need them. It's supposed to be happening. Oh, my gosh. It's my favorite book of all time. I was going to ask you what's your favorite book of all time, but instead, <laughs> <laughs> good old Orwell. Um, oh, hang on, it's uh, this isn't mine. This belongs to my wife. This is a. Oh. Theater. My wife was. Um, what What was your um, position on that production? Uh, uh, I was the technical stage. Manager. Technical stage manager for uh, 1984 when it was on at the West End some years ago, and. Um, oh, that's awesome! I'm going to scan very quickly for a question. And I shouldn't take too long over this because um, you've been here for a good two hours and six minutes and it's 11 o'clock in the evening where I'm from. So let's see. The question that I'm going to ask you is... Oh, wow. I've stumbled on a genuinely good question. The question is this. Are you prepared to lose your identity and live out the rest of your life as a waiter or dock worker? No, I don't. I, I don't <laughs> want to do that. You said like you were working as a waiter during your drive to Alaska or something along those lines. Yeah, at IHOP, International House of Pancakes. So uh, you, you know what it's like, and you don't want to do it anymore. Right? Yeah, been there, done that. I I'm gonna do whatever I can to keep this ride going. So plus my identity. Well, you know, I like, um, I like my identity. I don't know. I, I wouldn't become a waiter because I'd re I'm really bad at it. I just drop stuff. Oh yeah, I you know how some of the waiters can do the uh, the thing with multiple glasses and they walk around. I I always individually handed them and I would like walk all across the room and do it like that. <laughs> so it took me like three times as long. And so my tips. One time this guy came in, uh, forty five dollar bill, zero dollars tips. And the reason why it was because wait, 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 of forty five dollar bill. Oh, you don't even have tips over there, right? So yeah, we we because you well, know, we did tip, but we don't have a forty-five dollar bill. <laughs> no, no, uh, I'm sorry, forty. Uh, oh, uh, oh, Bill, oh, Bill, right, right. Yeah, got it, got it. Uh, he spent forty-five dollars on his food. Um, it was just him and one other person, and they got all this food, and he didn't tip me because I didn't um, remember to refill his orange juice. I will never forget that. And so the uh, the hostess, you know, the one at the front of the restaurant who kind of greets you and gets you a table when you walk in, uh, she was so upset by that because she, she kind of knew that I, I I barely made enough money. I didn't make minimum wage a lot of times because I was such a bad waiter. Um, and this is like, at the time I had um, 
two college degrees and I was horrible at this job, but she, she felt so bad at me. She like made the guy, she yelled at the guy. She's like, you need to tip him. And so he ended up uh, giving me like a $5 bill or something, but he was, he didn't refill my orange juice. You know, I, I do That's not. What's wrong with tipping. It makes everything scarier. I used to, um, one of the jobs I loved doing uh, before I went full-time doing YouTube and comedy was I was a tour guide. Um, I used to drive people around central London in classic mini Coopers, like the old, very small cars from the sixties. Um, and I loved that job, but, um, a lot of it was about, especially if they were from America, you would have to try really hard to earn a tip at the end because they'd expect to give you one and it can completely change the amount you'd earn that day. And it was exciting, but stressful. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I feel bad though. When we were in the UK, I didn't really tip because I was it, like, people kept telling me not to. There are some people who argue that it's. Tipping is a bad thing because it encourages employers to pay less. Right. And the idea that we become a system where workers rely on tips is very bad and therefore tipping is bad. But at the other end of the scale, don't be a dick, tip. Yeah, but it also depends on which uh, kind of service, right? Because some services, is, you know, you don't tip for dry cleaning, right? Or, or you know, or there's like certain no, things. It would be unusual to tip for dry cleaning, but I think in a restaurant, basically, if you're dealing with a human and they are able to, you know, make your day better by working harder, then yes, you tip them. Oh, yeah. Well, because, I mean, here in the United States, we we tip for everything. I mean, it's it's kind of ridiculous. But at the same time, I like now that I can afford it, I, I don't mind. I mean, like, here, you have a crappy service job. I know what it's like. I did that for many years. I mean, I've worked in every service job imaginable and. Uh, I was a valet uh, manager, uh, like park people's cars. And That's we were not the ultimate uh, tipping job, isn't it? Yeah. But the crazy thing was when I worked at hospitals, um, it was actually frowned upon to get tips. And so like we were always like, they were like sneaking money to us because they um, technically we were not allowed to, to take them. And, but it, you know, we weren't getting paid that well. So we took them, of course, you know, it's just, it's, it's a weird system. If Yeah, you're right. It depends whether you kept all the tips that were given to you for yourself or whether there was a pot and at the end of the day all the workers would share it among them yeah yeah it also flies in the face of why they're tipping you anyway it's a it's a thorny issue that's difficult to go into at 11 minutes past 11 at night embrace the story is here uh from from england as well we actually right, met up with him uh and uh we ate at a restaurant with him and i think i remember like asking him like do we tip here and i remember yeah uh I think I have one more question for you. I think I we didn't get to my tenth question because you rudely interrupted. No, I'm so <laughs> with your 1984. No, it's good. Uh, so my it's last. Because, this is a good one to end. Um, what do you have yet to accomplish creative, creatively in your life um, that you absolutely have to accomplish before you die? Oh wow. Creatively, I don't know. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff I've never attempted before. I've never written a musical. I've never ridden a motorcycle round and round inside a big cage. Um, my plan for the moment is to just sort of carry on what I'm doing. I've got a vague idea of what the next series on my YouTube channel is going to be about, and it's reasonably exciting. But I think an ambition I've always had, something that I want to do at least once before I die, is leave the country in the middle of a sentence. I've always wanted whilst talking to somebody to just decide I'm bored and then get up and grab my passport, go to the airport and leave the country. Because it's the sort of spontaneous thing that realistically is never going to happen because, you know, we've all got lives. But that's a decadence that I can only dream of. In fact, you know what? I've been saying that for a long time. And now that I'm a dad, I don't think I want to do that anymore. <laughs> I'm going to change my ambition to... Um, I want the world's biggest bouncy castle. Yeah. That's what I'd like to achieve creatively is to bounce in a more medium sized height than anyone has ever bounced before on a bouncy castle. And now that you have kids that you can, With you can do that and not be looked at, not, not be frowned upon by society <laughs> for getting one of those. Yeah. We genuinely, we were, cause it's my 40th this year and we were thinking, well, what am I going to do? What should my 40th birthday party be? It should be something exciting. And a while ago, it was suggested that it should be like a soft play for adults. That would be great fun. But I've got two kids now, and the vibe would be so different. <laughs> What's Daddy doing? Well, congratulations on becoming a dad. That's a real big deal. I, 
Thank you. I, I love being a dad. Um, and it's weird. You're, they're both boys, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a whole nother. I mean, I have nephews, but it's just like I feel people always say, oh, man, you don't even know. It's like how different it is. Like, because uh, I feel like it's just now starting to get difficult with the 12 year old. It's like, oh, hormones are changing. And now all of a sudden, like, but, you know, you're. When you were little, it was so easy. But I feel like boys, a lot of times, just running around and hitting things and throwing things and trashing things is what. Yeah, my life is. So. bracing myself for the next years of you know two boys really close in age growing up and becoming teenagers at about the same time. That's going to be so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, Patreon supporter Michael, thanks for being here. Thanks for the super chat. Uh, says you're the funniest guest I've had on. For oh, thank you, Michael. Ago. Wait, does he mean me or my wife? Oh. Uh, I thank you. I, well, uh, but yeah, like I know it's it's late over there in London, so uh, we'll wrap this up. Um, I, Do you know what's going to happen? I know full well that as soon as we've said goodbye and hung up and ended the stream, I'm going to think of loads of things I should have asked and should have said, but um, such is the way. <laughs> that was my challenge. Actually, the, the thing I really uh, had, a, had a hard time with was like narrowing it down because I actually had like 15 questions on here, but I'm glad I left the one more. The only thing is, if we do one more, it's not going to say 11th question on the bottom of the screen because um, you don't have the graphics for it. Or do you? I can create one. Watch this. We'll have to make it a quick fire round. But I feel bad. You said you had like 15 other questions. I can't leave you hanging. Oh, whoops. What did I do? Oh, no. You've now there's a 11th question in big. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Okay, well, actually, uh, it's it's okay. You don't have an eleventh one. It's okay. Uh, I mean, I, can I, trust I feel like it's gonna throw it. Uh, it well, let's see if there's any other super chats though. That might have have a. Jade, you've been watching the chat coming in. Has anyone asked any intriguing questions? Oh, uh, Stefan says he also. Did you answer this one? Oh, you did the biscuit. No, I've answered this. What's your favorite? Got... Question? Ready, salted. What's my favorite video I've made? Uh, I still say ready, salted. It's the best flavor video. Because you know <laughs> what you get with ready, salted. I don't know why it's called ready, salted, though. In in the US, um, when when your like, potato chips um, don't have any flavor, it's just salt. What do you call that? Because we call it ready, salted, which is weird. Uh, we just call them chips. Uh, <laughs> oh, and you don't, yeah, you call them crisps, don't you? Uh, so we do. So um, in Britain, what we call crisps, what you call potato chips, we have them in individual bags that you're not supposed to share, and you have them with your lunch, and you have them in these great big bags that you uh, eat while you're watching films. And we so, don't share them either. We don't share the big bag <laughs> bags either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you but, um, yeah, my, my answer is very dull because I know that something we do in this country very well is interesting crisp flavors. And um, I just like a good old fashioned, no nonsense, ready salted crisp. And the if thing that I as dull as liking the Beatles, well, so be it. I mean, the thing I tell everybody more than anything when they ask about, oh, how was the UK? Because we were there for two weeks and um, I was like, the food is just so much better. And that might surprise you, like, because I know it's, your country is not known for. Um, having the best food in the world. But I tell you, compared to the United States, like everything just tastes better. And depends where you go. I mean, if you go to people's houses and have them cook for you, you find out what the country is really good at. We did that. Actually, we have friends that live uh, there. And yeah, that did happen a couple of times. I was like, yeah, it's. And at any point, did you have beans on toast and a nice hot cup of tea? Uh, I actually, believe it or not, my daughter did. I did not try that. I, tea, yes, not the beans on toast. The beans on toast, I was, I was a, a little bit too adventurous for me. <laughs> You're not supposed to like it. Oh, you just okay. It's just something you do. It scores three out of three. Oh, uh, one is make it stop. It hurts. Two is this will do, I suppose. And three is good. And you'll find that if you use that scale, most things score the maximum three out of three. It's the secret to happiness. Uh, Mrs. Beat is here, and she did say she tried the the beans on toast. So, and she says it wasn't good. So, <laughs> you can improve it no end with a bit of Worcestershire sauce. Uh, thank you. Ask. 
for the donation. Uh, what's NOK? What is that? Norwegian okay. Krona. Oh, Nor Norwegian. Oh, I don't know how much 10 is in, in your money. Uh, let's, let's just pretend like it's a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do want to, uh, the final thing I want to bring up here is, uh, you know, I, I view this still as a parasocial relationship and I made a whole video and uh, I watched it. I was in it. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I, I just gotta, I should say, by the way, like, actually, this is my opportunity to apologize to you. We planned this um, live stream many, many months ago. And I said, yes, please. And then I just didn't get back to you forever because um, my kids and I was incredibly disorganized. But I'm so sorry for like just saying yes and then saying nothing for such a long time. So I'm glad I'm finally here now to actually finally do the podcast. Uh, you are not only here. When I watched your video, uh oh. I'm in trouble now because it actually got mentioned. He says, and so here's Jay Foreman who didn't get back to me. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh my gosh. I was afraid that might happen. I'm very sorry. Crap. Uh, I didn't mean to make you feel bad. And for also, like you have more than made up for it now because you are not only here, but you are here with COVID. So that means a lot. So thank you for that. But no, I just wanted to bring up this weird dynamic that's on the internet because it's just such a weird thing. Because like all of us, we watch YouTubers that we don't know, and we feel like we have this relationship with them, uh, but we don't. It's one-sided. And it's just a, like, it's such a fascinating thing to me. And that's why I felt like I needed a video, but I felt like it helped. Well, interesting. I think it's, you get it more with YouTubers than you do with like um, traditional celebrities from the olden days, uh, because you have a, what feels like a more personal relationship with them. Because I think I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, like the um, the way you spread yourself around the Internet nowadays is not by being known by more people. It's by being known by the, the right kind of person that could be spread far and wide around the world. So, um, yeah, it, it does feel more than it used to like, you know, personally, this person that can't possibly know who you are. Yeah, I mean. It's just a, a strange thing because, like, I, I've met a lot of my viewers in real life. Um, have you had meetups with your viewers before? I haven't done meetups on purpose. I'd like sometimes someone will say hello if I'm like out and about on a train. And I do admit that, like, if I'm at a party and I don't know anyone, and if someone says to me, I watch your videos, then I instantly feel at ease. Like, oh, well, you know, we've, we've got something in common. Like, I, I know that you've watched my stuff and I feel a bit relaxed in a strange way. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, it it is weird though because you still they're always easy to talk to, so like even if you don't know them, they're a complete stranger because they know you so well. Um, it's just like oh okay, it's like almost like going to a reunion, a uh, family reunion where yeah. there's like and like oh here's your second cousin uh, Jesse, um, and like oh but you know we're supposed to know each other but we don't. You That's know, a good comparison actually because you've got this sort of feeling that comes from somewhere that you know you're okay with this person they're fine you can relax even though you've never met them before and i guess that is the same as this is a family member so see I, i'm okay um and thank <laughs> so uh but thanks for for uh doing this and yeah like uh i think we should follow up with this banana thing we're kind of obligated you have to now i've been paid for it. it's gonna happen yeah it's another 75 pounds david bennett piano 75 pounds banana no, it's the same one. It's the same one. It's well, the same on. same one. No, that's the same one. Oh, I see. I see. Right, I put it okay. back up on the screen just to remind us. So this All right. is David, I'm as good as my word. I'm going to eat the banana and I'm probably going to eat it in your presence. And this is what you asked for. So um, here we go. <laughs> okay. I will uh, transfer. I'll make the transfer. Um, once you do it, I need proof. Uh <laughs> and uh just i'll get your venmo information and yeah just so, just so this is all this is live so we i guess we have to commit to it now uh, and uh looking forward to that everyone if you are not subscribed to jay foreman go do it now um it's a wonderful oh, thank you yeah um and uh thanks for for being here everyone uh, enjoy the rest of your uh life and thank you so so much for having me it's been a pleasure thank you so much heck yeah